Hi, Jack. Man, how are you? Oh, my God. How are you? Wow. I, I started early. I was like, let me just start a little earlier. Uh, oh, no. I'm, I'm ready to roll. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Let me make you share. Um, and then you can, uh, I mean, we'll give a couple of minutes for people to sure, join. Sure, of course. Of course. I'm glad. Um, I, I'm glad to see you first time. How are you? <laughs> very, very, very well. Very well. Uh, I've got about 60 slides. Okay, you can go as, I mean, yeah. two and a half, three hours, and if yeah. you need more, and, let me know, and uh, we can schedule another. Yeah, uh, and hopefully we can, uh, uh, you know, I go through the, four, I'm going to go through the four orders, and what I like to do is, um, if, if folks can, if they have a question about the specific slide, like something that's not clear, that we do, you know, we deal with it, and then kind of put the extended discussion afterwards but but we can because otherwise we never get through all the slides you know what i mean oh, and, and when everybody joins you get you can present okay. how you want uh to proceed so some uh, people like awesome. you know, information question i can say why don't you raise hand on or you can say question through the chat and then we can address it in an intermission of some kind. right right and uh, and usually when I've got the you know full screen slides up as you know I can't see the chat so uh, and so so I, I mean you know I can I can unshare when we decide to do the chat we, I can unshare and then I think we I lost you for a second deal with it yeah you got me yeah now it's good yeah I think there's something wrong with my internet it's it's very unstable and uh, that's why. Go ahead and share right now because if you lose me, at least you have you know you, I have you. I made you, uh, you know, uh, I made you present. So I don't think you right. just for some reason we it's raining out here. So it's uh, the uh, internet connection. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just want to welcome and um, occasionally I pop off too, but don't panic. I always get right back on. It's just a matter of waiting for a second, and I'll be back. I know, I know. It, you know, Donald Trump had to reduce the speed of the internet and, and <laughs> clogging the whole, you know, network. Right? What did that man do? <laughs> what, what did he do? What did he do? I could say, though, well, you would have to bring him up. <laughs> yeah, I remember this is the case right after uh, George Bush II was voted out of office, too. Everything was his fault. I think that's one of the burdens of being the president. You know? Until more, and same thing for Reagan. Of course, time drifted on, and all of a sudden he was okay. So I don't well, know. Reagan can't do no wrong. I mean, he destroyed an evil empire. So I'm when thankful the, for him. I'm here in the United States. You know, I yeah. I, I cannot, I cannot blame Reagan for one thing. You know. <laughs> well, it wasn't true at the time. Uh, so you know, time has a funny way of of. Uh, reframing his historical recollection, but I don't want to get into politics. Last thing I want to do. By the way, Anne, you don't know me. It's Ava from Toronto. I like your screen behind you. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, the cherry blossoms. And yes, ja my, Japanese. My being here in D.C., uh, it won't be too long, about six weeks, maybe not that long, uh, before we have the real cherry blossoms, which are so beautiful here. Yeah, and we have them in our high park in Toronto, but they wouldn't let anybody go in last year because of COVID, right? Because too many people. Yeah, I forget exactly how they handled it here last year. I think there were just fewer people that even wanted to. Um, but we have them all over. Every residential neighborhood has them. They're everywhere. So you don't have to go far to actually see them. It's just the ones downtown are so picture perfect and just exactly like the postcards you go and you're like i'm not disappointed this is exactly the way i expected it would be it's it's very spectacular i have uh i had uh some uh, uh a zoom call with some folks in japan recently and we discussed that because of course our original um yes cherry blossoms were a gift from japan see zach there's a subject we could discuss uh at the ROM, um, tulips. Tulips are uh, a because fascinating they came from the you know Islam. Turkey. See, 
they came from Turkey. I'm Dutch, so uh, when you mention tulips, I'm 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 in. <laughs> I'm in. Uh, yeah, so. I do I do want to uh, do some uh, botanist type of um, you know presentation. Even if you want to talk about you know uh, art of um, what do they call the uh, ikebanas, right? Uh, the the ones that yeah yeah ikebana. Yeah. Yeah, what, you know, like if somebody knows a lot about it, you know, or a writing system uh, from China, you know, it was developed history of writing system or the, or this art. I mean, it's, it's amazing, I, I, you know, and we can even take different gardens, you know, we can, we can go to, you know, Versailles and then we can do, you know, Japan and like combine it all. And I don't know, however you guys would, you know, I, I'm looking for subject matters like there's no tomorrow. Like I'm making up subject matter. I recently had... <laughs> and I recently had a, a history of sex in ancient Rome, Gre Greece, and, and, and Egypt. And believe it or not, it already has over five days, it already has um, 130 hits on my YouTube channel. <laughs> people, I, people I'm, I'm, somehow, I'm not surprised about that, Jack. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had, uh, well, we had the exhibition of Pompeii. And we all know what went on in Pompeii with their little, I call them emojis on their uh, sidewalks pointing to their, you know, what taverns? <laughs> well, we have a different kind of topic today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is your, this is the antidote, Zach. <laughs> uh, hopefully we have a different topic today. Uh, so uh, we've had, uh, it looks like we're pulling through winter at this stage of the game here in the Washington area, Washington, D.C. Once we get past President's Day weekend, where you, uh, you know, week, uh, we're, we're pretty safe for the rest, you know, it's winding down at that point. Wow. Yeah, yeah it's been a mild winter here. Talking about different top topics, um, maybe in general, and which orders are you going to be talking about? Are you going to touch on Qatar's at all, or no? That that's not. Really no, I am just mainly going to focus on the big four, so to speak. Uh, uh, the Benedictines, uh, the um, Franciscans, the Dominicans, and the Jesuits. Excellent. Uh, so I think if we can pretty much cover those, we'll have accomplished a lot. So the Franciscan, that was interesting, right? The uh, Argentinian Pope in 2013 actually took uh, the uh, name Francis first time ever. I didn't really realize that. Now, what kind of, what order, you know, the, the well, a, we'll get to this in the presentation. Uh, I, I cover the Pope, as a matter of fact. He's my grand finale. <laughs> uh -oh. I mean, the most one that I respect is the Polish, uh, because I think that, completely i mean he saved the family in the holocaust i mean it, it is something like out of out of the out of the ordinary so I, yeah know, J john paul ii had a remarkable personal history yeah, for sure it's, it's crazy and then he tried to bring the world together i mean it's just amazing you know uh to me um so i i i'm always i mean when people say oh what do they do during the world war ii listen you know if you were in world war ii what would you do you know, a lot of people turn evil, you know, uh, that's a problem. That's a problem, you know? Yeah. What would you do? It's the uh, Hitler had a, you know, a pulse on that, you know, on everybody's, he would, you know, had a hand on everybody's pulse. I mean, there's nothing you could do. Yeah. Could have done, you know? As that's, that's, that's the strange thing about it. Everybody went kind of quiet. Sergio is here. John is here. How are you guys? Okay. Uh, barely. Mr. Well, almost out of February, my least favorite month. <laughs> least favorite, yeah. Yeah, Mike. it's a matter of hours now. Yes. Mike is new here. How are you? Welcome. Luis, Hello. Luis is here. How are you? Uh, Jane. Hi. Mm -hmm. I think Jane, I saw you before. Once or twice you came on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Steve. Hi, Jack. How's everybody? Good. Oh my God! Always looking great. <laughs> what? They're always looking good. I said. Oh, oh, thank you. That's very nice of you. I'm wearing my glasses, so I feel like a. Uh, <laughs> you look Zach, very I learned. Almost, I almost oh, thank forgot. You. I almost forgot today. 
What did you forget, Eva? I almost forgot. I was five to four, and I said, "What do I have to do today?" Oh, you don't, you don't want to miss this. No. Ian's just phenomenal. <laughs> phenomenal. This is gonna be yeah. Uh, I'm really really excited. No, uh, first of all, I want to thank Aunt, Aunt for proposing to present this. 27 people signed up. I don't know how many people are going to show up. I mean, we already have 17. Really interesting. Uh, you know, and hopefully, um, and like I said, if you guys want to see this on the video, also, I'll post it on my channel. But also, I have we have a website where we have social networks there. We have Instagram. We have Twitter. Um, we have Facebook for this group and uh, in this, you know, the website called omnicarta.org, I'll post it in the chat. And they have a, we have a schedule there of every presentation. We have another, a lot of exciting presentations that's gonna be coming up, uh, Napoleon and uh, you know, um, Diodoci, uh, and then we'll have you know, Mark talking about um, you know, uh, history of wine, you know, and how the wine tasting, maybe, you know, people could, you know, maybe if they have wine at home and it's like a, you know, something that he can explain, you know, <laughs> maybe we can go over that as well. I don't know. We do a lot of crazy stuff, you know. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, recently we started the sports section. We have ancient texts. We just went through it. If, if you guys can watch this video, it's amazing video uh, Paul just did recently on Odyssey, Homer. Oh, my God took it off the park completely. It was just, it was, it was something. And um, yeah. Yeah. I, I love that video that I was just listening to it the other day while cleaning my apartment as like a background. And uh, yeah, it was pretty good. It was, it was like a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was, um, it was something. And then I like it when, you know, he comes in, he goes, I'm not a historian or, you know, stuff like that. It's almost like say, I'm not a magician. I'm just learning, and and then he <laughs> presents something like that, and everybody's mm -hmm. like, "Okay, I think you're a historian." <laughs> so that's awesome. I don't know if his Paul is on today, but his daughter joined, and now she wants to come to, uh, of, you know, at least know uh, where we stream, and we also stream this live on Facebook. Once I figure out how to stream on LinkedIn and uh, other platforms, I will stream as well. It only allows you to stream one stream. So that's why I, I post it and record it. All right, and um, you wanna give it a couple more minutes? Uh, we already have 20. Sure. Yeah, okay. Apple sure. And, and share today, uh, again, you wanna lay down the rules while we're on? How do you want? <laughs> well, I don't wanna call it laying down the rules, but uh, I've got, I'm gonna be trying to do a brief, you know, 30,000 foot overview of four of the major uh, Roman Catholic religion order, religious orders, the, uh, the Benedictines, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and the Jesuits. And I've got about 60 slides. So um, I, in, what I like to do is try to get through the slides um, to some extent. Certainly, if you have a clarifying question, feel free to cut in. Um, you can put questions in the, the chat but when I have the full screen, the full presentation screen up on my uh, computer, I usually can't see the chats and I forget to look anyway. So hopefully Zach will monitor that. And if it's something pressing, then, uh, you know, he'll chime right in and, and I can hopefully answer it. Um, and then hopefully we'll have enough time once we kind of get through the tra trajectory of the slides narrative to have, you know, some extended discussion about various topics that people were particularly interested in. But of course, it's a, it's a huge thing. And so any little sentence that I mention is something that you could practically do a whole presentation on. So um, again, hopefully when this is over, you'll be able to tell the difference between, uh, between those four categories, uh, a Benedictine, a Franciscan, a Dominican, and a Jesuit. Uh, interesting enough, I mean, while we're, you know, a couple of minutes is, I was reading recently about Qatars and, uh, and then, you know, Franciscans and, you know, how they wanted to take it back to, you know, being poor and not having everything, you know, um, initially, uh, obviously, when all these orders were set up, 
and knowing that you know a lot, you know a, you know a lot of monks they can't really marry anybody and stuff like that so they were very frugal and stuff like that so all this um, other uh, groups that were created, they were betting on the fact that, you know, uh, that let's go back to that, you know, frugality and being poor and helping people and stuff like that. So it's interesting. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Western Europe, yes. Roman Catholic, religious. <laughs> Ta da. Uh, yep. sh shall we go ahead and get started? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, Western European, Roman Catholic religious orders, uh, which is a mouthful, but it's in order to sort of uh, narrow exactly what we're talking about uh, in, in terms of uh, focus. Um, what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of a story about why, why I'm of that interest. Uh, for a time here in the Washington, I've lived all over neighborhoods in Washington, but I lived in the neighborhood of Washington in the Northwest quadrant, Northeast quadrant, called Brookland, not Brooklyn, Brookland, which is where Catholic University is located. And since I'm a Catholic, um, I often attended mass at what were a great variety of abbeys and monasteries and convents and houses of study that all the various orders maintain in the vicinity of Catholic University so that their, their, um, their members, their brothers, their friars, their sisters, uh, while they're taking, can stay while they're taking various courses at Catholic. Um, so this, at some point, as I went to all these various places, it occurred to me Ah, I'm watching a Franciscan uh, uh, offering mass. I'm watching a Dominican. I'm watching a Benedictine. And I thought, well, wait a minute. What are the differences in those? And that sort of started my journey in kind of asking questions, doing a little bit of background greeting. And again, I had to do this even being raised a Catholic. Um, so it's it's not generally known. Uh, 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 I. I characterize my knowledge of this vast area as a mile wide and an inch deep. So probably a lot of the questions you're going to be asking me, the answers are going to be, I don't know. <laughs> but at least it'll, it'll open questions. And as I said, you'll come away with a little bit better idea of, of the, uh, various, um, the various kinds of religious orders that are uh, have made up uh, the Catholic tradition in that regard. And I hope, uh, should anyone in the future view this, uh, this, this uh, video that uh, Zach will be posting, they see gross errors in it, I hope they'll forgive me. <laughs> uh, and this is just to show, uh, this is that area of Catholic University that I lived in the midst of. There's the Dominican House of Studies, the Franciscan Monastery, uh, up in the corner is the uh, Benedictine Abbey, uh, St. Anselm, and then a convent of the Poor Clares, who are actually, as we'll learn later, actually Franciscans. As you can see, these are very beautiful properties, and it was, you know, it was a, a pleasure to be living in, in that, that, that area uh, because of those, uh, their presence. All right, getting on to the religious orders. Now, you know, you always need a, one always needs a definition to launch from. And I would generally, and this is, you know, a, a aggregation of several definitions that I sort of Googled around on. A religious order is a lineage of communities and organizations of people who live in some way set apart from society in accordance with their specific religious devotion. Uh, and their, their lifestyle is usually characterized by the principles of its founders' religious practice. And in the, in the Roman Catholic tradition, that's called the order's rule with a capital R, which again, we'll be talking about um, uh, further. Now, of course, Catholics did not uh, invent um, the idea of leading a, a, a religious life uh, separate from ordinary secret, uh, secular life. Uh, that they can be found in certainly the Greek Orthodox tradition. Uh, in the, in the Islamic, arguably the Islamic tradition, uh, somewhat in the Judaic tradition, and of course in the Buddhist tradition. Um, in the Orthodox tradition, of course, 
Uh, everyone's aware of uh, the island or the peninsula of Mount Athos, uh, which has numerous monasteries uh, dating back centuries and centuries. These are magnificent, magnificent structures. Uh, uh, most of them, I think, uh, some are, are predate medieval times. Many are from about the medieval period. Uh, of course, Greek Orthodoxy, there was a split between Greek Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. So they are two distinct traditions. Um, in the Islamic tradition, of course, uh, they, they don't really have uh, 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 the tradition of uh, religious orders in the sense of the Greek or the Roman Catholics. Uh, however, um, you know, the communities of Sufi masters are sometimes cited as, as that kind of tradition. People of like mind that, that periodically, uh, in the case of Sufis, uh, come together uh, to be separate from um, uh, the, the secular mainstream of life and pursue their spiritual aspirations. Uh, also in the Judaic tradition, which now does not have really a religious orders component, uh, we're all familiar with the Essene settlement uh, at Qumran, which was very much a proto-monastic way of life. So, so again, it's a tradition that goes way back of people, certain people simply wanting to pursue their spiritual lives in a, in a different way, committed to a community. Uh, and last but not least, as precedents to the Roman Catholic tradition are the great Buddhist monasteries. Uh, that's a picture of Angkor Wat, um, which uh, is again from the uh, 1200s, as I recall. It's religious, original, originally a Hindu temple uh, and a, a, a tremendous um, monastic or uh, campus uh, that was was an island unto itself in, its, uh, in effect. And there are, of course, the present tradition of Buddhist monks, which continues alive and well throughout all of, um, of East Asia. Uh, so we get specifically to our Roman Catholic tradition. And this is a little depiction of some of the orders we're going to be talking uh, talking about. The, uh, the man on the far um, left is a Benedictine, as we'll learn about. Uh, the man in the middle uh, is a, with the red book, is I think meant to be a uh, Dominican, uh, and uh, as is the man next to him, and then the man on the far, uh, far right is a Franciscan. Uh, meant to be a Franciscan. So what is kind of distinctive about Roman Catholic uh, religious orders? Uh, again, it's a community of consecrated life with members that pro profess solemn vows. Uh, by consecrated life, that generally refers to the idea of you are consecrating yourself uh, to prayer. Um, and professing solemn vows, which are usually uh, the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, are basically a vow to accept the rules of the community that you've chosen to join. Uh, there are two main, main branches of the types of religious orders that we're going to be talking about. One are the monastics, uh, uh, and the Benedictines are going to be the, the, the primary example of them. They literally lived in monasteries uh, in medieval times uh, and um, are committed to a life that's structured by the divine office. The Benedictines were complemented uh, again, as we'll see, uh, in the uh, 12th century by mendicant orders. The mendicant orders, instead of being based at a specific monastery, traveled all over the place, could be reassigned all over the place. 
Um, and uh, that, that was uh, viewed as a mendicant lifestyle, that you're traveling around seeking alms, uh, which the, the monastics did as well. They certainly uh, solicited donations, but the difference is primarily this being anchored in a, a monastery community as opposed to being, in essence, a traveling preacher. Uh, that will be contrasted to the Jesuits who we'll see are actually not a monastic order. They're, they have, they never really uh, organize themselves around the concept of a monast monastic community. Um, they are what's known as clerics regular um, and who take religious vows to the order of the Society of Jesus but have a very differently structured uh, apostolic life. Apostolic meaning uh, in the tradition of the apostles, uh, the 12 apostles from the uh, New Testament. Can I ask you a question? When you, say sure. when you say traveling, do they travel from one monastery to another? And do they travel in groups or they were individuals that they were mendicants? Uh, the mendicants, uh, uh, again, they probably have had different, different orders have different rules with, with, with regard to whether they can travel alone or have to travel in groups. I think most in modern times can travel however they wish. Um, and they would, they would find, they certainly would travel from one, for example, Dominican or Franciscan establishment to another one, to a house or an abbey uh, or a priory of their order in whatever uh, city or town they were, were relocating to. Uh, so, so they, uh, whereas for example, the Benedictines, you basically were living entirely at one of their big monasteries in medieval times. Does that sort of help Marika? Uh, and can I ask another question? Uh, this is Greg. Uh, sure. Th those um, the orders are they uh, the origin of them? Uh, somehow are they related to Crusades or, or not? Because you mentioned Benedictines were uh, originated in 12th century. That's the times of Crusades. Well, the Benedictines were actually, uh, and that's a good question. They predated the Crusades uh, by several hundred years, um, and so they had involvement with the Crusades, as did the Dominicans and the, the Franciscans. Uh, however, uh, all of them had origins uh, as, as early as the six, seven hundreds. And I'll go over that a little bit about Benedict. Okay. okay. Uh, this actually goes to your question. <laughs> I'm not gonna go into detail on this slide, but it's a good visual. Uh, you will see over there in the uh, in the 600s, basically seventh century, uh, the Order of Saint Benedict uh, being established, and then around the time of the Middle Ages, uh, there were the emergence of other communities, some of which were just branches off of the basic Benedictine root, other of which, like the uh, like Saint Francis, the Franciscans. Uh, were entirely different new orders. So you can see uh, there, have been, there have been times in history where the emergence has clustered, uh, you know, for a variety of social, social, social reasons. Um, but it's, it's definitely a long tradition. Um, uh, now, I mentioned that they, they the, the orders live by their orders rule. Um, and one of the earliest rules, uh, which is basically a constitution for the community, um, you know, uh, how does one become a member? How does one conduct themselves as a member, etc., cetera, uh, to put it in secular terms. Uh, and one of the earliest of these rules was the rule of the great Saint Augustine. Um, and in his biography, when he 
first came back to North Africa from having been in uh, Milan for several years, uh, he sold his inheritance uh, and basically took the fa family house and and set up a monastic foundation. Uh, monad meaning one, a cell of one. Uh, originally, the idea was to some extent that these were going to be cells of 12 people, uh, like the, the, the cell C-E-L-L-S, uh, like the apostles. Now, of course, that that concept expanded over time. Uh, um, so, and Augustine specifically was contrasting his monastic concept with the concept of hermits. Uh, hermits is a great Eastern tradition where, you know, the hermits in the caves, the holy men in the caves. And Augustine was saying, that's not what I have in mind. I have in mind a group of people who are in the world, uh, have, have engagement with the world, but nevertheless have a lifestyle, a personal lifestyle in this, you know, according to this monastic uh, community arrangement. Um, now, his rule uh, which he wrote down apparently uh, was was brought into Europe uh, when there when the Vandals were were sort of raiding all of um, North Africa. So at this time, some of these communities, in essence, fled. I'm sure I don't I don't know all the details, but fled to uh, Italy, southern France. And, and they brought this rule with them. They set up communities and starting li started living the life that they had led in, in North Africa. Um, this, this nascent uh, idea of a community with rules and a vow to live by those rules uh, was adopted by most famously by St. Benedict, uh, who was, was you know, 300 years after St. Augustine, but it was St. Benedict's take on this that really took off as the, the root uh, and uh, then tree, you know, tree of uh, monastic life uh, in the context of Western Europe, Western medieval Europe. Um, this is St. Benedict and uh, he established the uh, monastery of Monte Cassino in um, in, uh, in northern Italy uh, in, uh, in during the period of his life, which was 480 to 547. Uh, of course, Monte, Monte, Monte Cassino stands to this day. It wasn't that big at the time that uh, uh, Saint Benedict uh, founded it, but. Um, uh, nevertheless, and it was bombed during Second World War, is my understanding. It, it still stands today. Uh, and, and now St. Benedict's rule uh, was uh, about a, was, a, was it like the affair. It was more like a, a book. Um, and it, over, it set out in great detail uh, life in the community. Um, uh, various, the organization of the community, a community normally had a head, the prior, uh, P-R-I-O-R, uh, it set out the regimen of prayer, it set out the, uh, disciplinary, uh, framework, if someone ran afoul of the rules, how that would be, uh, handled. Uh, it set out dietary practices. Um, it was extremely, extremely well thoroughly formulated. Um, and these, these, the Benedictine's houses were all self-governing. Um, but by a, the rule itself had been approved uh, by the Pope, uh, which again made it somewhat different from the Augustinian rule, which. The Augustinian rule up to that time had been, I think those communities were more informal. Uh, this was a great formalization of that concept. 
uh, great in the sense of large formula, formulization of that concept. Uh, and, you know, here's a picture, uh, presumably, of a rule being given to uh, a qualifying group of a qualifying, a group of, of uh, a monastic group that were going to call themselves Benedictines. Why? Because they were living according to the rules of St. Benedict. Uh, and uh, the vows taken were with regard to abiding by that rule. Now, over time, we'll see that different communities made changes to those rules, each of which they would subsequently uh, get approved by the Pope for their particular community. And uh, sometimes the rules were slight enough that they were still considered Benedictine. In other instances, they were, as in the cases uh, of the Franciscans, were completely new, new rules. Uh, so what such that what, it was no longer, one no longer considered oneself living uh, according to the Benedictine rule, one was living according to the Franciscan rule, or as we'll see, the Dominican rule. Uh, the rule, this is, this is a nice little website I uh, found from a, a, a contemporary Benedictine uh, website, uh, which kind of it gives a nice overview of the aspects of communal life that the rule covers, because it's still uh, for the core group of Benedictines, uh, the rule that they follow. Uh, prayer, which we'll talk about uh, 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 in the next couple of slides was was the absolute foundation. These were communities of prayer. Um, uh, you know, prayer and worship of God according to the Catholic tradition. Uh, they were also communities of work. These, these great monasteries were self-sustaining by and large. Um, they they grew their own food, they grew their own wine, they made their own clothes, uh, and they had, as time went on, other other activities like the famous scriptoriums, where they uh, the, the uh, where they did such beautiful work with the illustrated manuscripts. Uh, another aspect of life is study. One is that's why these monasteries became great repositories of. Uh, of uh, ancient materials and libraries. Uh, so each, each uh, Benedictine's life uh, included periods for study, for improving to oneself. Um, this website talks about hospitality, which was another thing that the monasteries uh, did, have, did have capacities for, uh, uh, for um, people traveling by to uh, spend the night either in a separate building or um, if they were religious themselves, probably within the community. Um, and then, you know, the idea of renewal, which is that you're constantly working on your own spiritual development and, you know, evolving towards um, a better, uh, better community with God. So, that, that's an oversight. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a defined way of life. Um, I've mentioned a couple times the divine office, and I wanted to talk about this as a preliminary, another preliminary point about what that is, because you all may have heard of that. What is this divine office? It's also called sometimes, the book itself is sometimes referred to as a psalter or a breviary. Um, and this is a picture of a modern uh Reverie. It's called now called Christian Prayer, the Liturgy of the Hours, and that actually is a photo that was online of the chapel at the Dominican House of Studies, which was near where I lived. And there are the Dominicans uh, in the chapel in the course of uh, 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 singing, as it's called. Uh, sometimes they sing, sometimes they speak, uh, whatever hour it is. Now these hours basically defined the entire day. Um, matins started uh, in this case, which is kind of the extreme case, uh, at 2 a.m., which is basically the uh, vigil for the next day. 
Uh, Louds was dawn prayer at 5 a.m. Prime was early morning prayer at say 6 a.m. And uh, then mid morning prayer, terse, 9 a.m. Uh, you know, when you get up that early, 9 a.m. is mid morning. Uh, sex or midday prayer, which is 12 noon. Known or mid afternoon prayer at three. Vespers at six. And Compli Compline, uh, which is night prayer before for these folks going to bed at seven. Now, again, that's not necessarily the modern model, but this was the classic high medieval model. And for these various uh, hours, uh, the, the, the entire community would con stop whatever they were doing and convene in the chapel uh, and pray whatever the divine, whatever the prayers were for that particular hour. And I have this picture over here, a famous Jean-Francois Villet picture of people praying the, the Angelus, because in point of fact, this, this way of keeping time, of, of uh, understanding time, uh, permeated to the, the entire medieval community, including the secular community. Um, when people heard the local church bells ringing at noon uh, uh, for midday prayer, uh, they stopped and said, the, in, in the case of noon, what's known as the Angelus, which is a, a prayer uh, to uh, uh, Mary, uh, the mother of Christ. Uh, these hours, too, uh, varied. It was like an accordion. Accordion. Midday, they didn't read, the time was not kept according to these numbers per se, you know, clocks actually being a, um, uh, a later medieval invention. Uh, so uh, Compline during the summer, or rather, let me say Vespers during the summer, would be at a later time than Vespers during the winter because it was keyed to sundown, for example. And the same in the earlier part of the day. It was keyed to the sun rising. And of course, as the year, as the uh, annual, the year goes on, uh, the sun sets later during the summer and sets earlier during the winter. Uh, but, you know, so it, it wasn't a matter of saying, you know, we always do Vespers at 6 p.m. They didn't, that Vespers would have been, in essence, controlled by the prior and the prior's assistants who kept track of such things, such that whatever the daylight period was, was divided into these various components. Um, and so this, this was the rhythm, this was this, this scheduling, this framework was the rhythm of, uh, of a monastic community's life. Um, and as I said, uh, I'll go back to show that picture. Well, actually, I think I have a better picture here. Uh, this, if you look inside uh, a breviary or, or um, a Christian book of Christian prayer, uh, there's actually pages for every day of the week, Monday through Monday through Sunday through Saturday is sort of the, the perspective. Uh, for a four-week period. It's almost like a lunar ca calendar. Uh, so uh, for, uh, you know, the fourth week in Monday, and these would be posted in the chapel, you know, it would be a great big Roman numeral four would be on a board, and everybody when they came in, if they hadn't been keeping track, would go, oh, it's the fourth week, I've got to go, and it's Monday, so I'll go to Monday, fourth week in the Beverly. And then for morning prayer, uh, there's, it's basically a series of psalms. Every morning is a psalm is recited, uh, two psalms are recited, then a canticle, which is a section from the Old Testament, uh, and then another psalm. And in the evening, it's a slightly different pattern. I'm sorry, I said two of them were two psalms, and then a canticle in the afternoon. And that would, that just goes on. Uh, you know, morning prayer, uh, evening prayer, 
then you get to, then you know your Tuesday week week four morning prayer evening prayer with the other intervening prayers it it was an all consuming pattern of life uh based based on this system of of praying um so that's that just to give you a little flavor of what that is of course uh, some of these books uh, were were gorgeous, um, gorgeous productions in and of themselves, uh, not only in the monasteries, but daily office can be prayed by lay people uh, in a much more uh, truncated sense. But, uh, you know, the the aristocracy would have these books, which they call books of out the book of the hours. And these would be beautifully illustrated. And even though they might not have pursued the morning, midday, nighttime schedule that you had in a monastery, they could nonetheless um, key themselves in to whatever of the four weeks it was, open up their book and start reading the prayers for that time of day and that day of the week and that week within the overall liturgical calendar which of course also entailed the great, the great uh, Catholic religious feasts like Christmas, Easter, et cetera. Um, so that's divine office. Uh, when it's said at a place like the Dominican House of Studies here in Washington, the way the Psalms are read too is they, the, the, uh, the fires go back and forth between the stanzas of a Psalm. So one side will say the first stanza, the second, the other side will say the second stanza, uh, while you know the one side is standing up and the other side is sitting down. Um, it's uh, it's an entire ritual, uh, which basically, if you join a community of this sort, becomes the ritual of your the pattern, the rhythm of your life, uh, in a deeper and deeper way, presumably as the years go on. Okay, so that's that's a couple of you know preliminary setups for for some of these. Uh, we talked about how uh, uh, you know the, the hermits were kind of the the early originators of the idea of leading a separate life. Um, uh, that then moved via Augustine's kind of reformulation of the hermetical idea to one of more of an active community idea. Uh, then we had St. Benedict's, the Benedictine rule was written, uh, and now we're going to talk a little bit more about specific Benedictine uh, monasteries, uh, the original one, of course, at Monte Cassino, Cluny, which was one of those instances of a group branching off from the main Benedictine branch, Carthusians, another one branched off from the main rule of St. Benedict and Cistercians. And uh, I'm, I'm mainly mentioning these because I think these are probably names you've heard or read and you're, I want to kind of put them in, in context so that the next time you hear or read them, you'll have a little, a little better idea of what context they, were, they emerge from. Um, I'm not really going to talk about the Knights Templars because they were not a monastic order or they were a military order, uh, quasi-military, uh, within the overall Roman Catholic Church framework. Uh, but just to put them in place, you can, can see where they, 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 they fit in the overall, um, the overall sequence. Uh, then came along uh, St. Dominic, who we're going to talk about, Francis of Assisi, um, the founding of the Dominican order, because a lot of times these founders uh, were kind of, they didn't, they didn't just wake up one day and found an order. They sort of evolved with friends, colleagues, a communal lifestyle to where it got to the point that they decided to actually formally approach the Pope with uh, with a set with a rule and um, have that approved so that they would be in a st newly established order um, and then actually the Jesuits are one of the late comers to the game and again as we'll discuss and I've mentioned they were not a monastic order um, 
as, as we'll see. So that's that's kind of the uh, the map of of where we're going to go go on this. Um, so uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, Benedict, the Benedictine rule of life, um, uh, and primarily because they were the original pattern for everything that came thereafter. Um, they're sometimes called, the, the, you'll see a Benedictine will have after his name, you know, John Smith, OSB, Father John Smith, OSB. The OSB stands for Order of St. Benedict. Uh, for the Dominicans, as we'll see, that, that, that tag will be OP for Order of Preachers. Uh, for Jesuits, it'll be SJ for Society of Jesus. Now, uh, let me mention that these religious orders are separate within the overall hierarchy, uh, overall structure of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they are separate from the uh, what might one what, what might what one might characterize as the diocesan order. So, from the Pope. Stemming from the Pope, you still at the same time in parallel to these communal organizations, uh, the typical church hierarchy of cat, cardinals, archbishops, bishops, and parish priests. The priests engaged in that structure uh, are generally not members of a religious order. Uh, they are they are uh, what's called uh, clerics regular. Um, now priests are priests, and members of the orders frequently became priests. Although not all monks became priests, you could be a monk and not be a priest. And conversely, uh, members of the monastic orders would get church high could be assigned to church hierarchical positions as cardinals or as uh, rectors of churches or as bishops or archbishops or even as the Pope. Uh, but, uh, you know, just to give you, give you that distinction, there's, there's a lot going on in the vastness that is the, the uh, history and organization of um, the Catholic Church. Uh, and uh, here I just mentioned uh, in this, this paragraph, the last paragraph, that the Benedictines um, don't operate under a single hierarchy. Now, we will, we will see that to some extent with, for example, the Franciscans. But the idea always was that the Benedictines, when they established a community, that community was an independent entity. Uh, 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 which had to stand on its own feet. It adopted the rule as the guidepost for the way the life, the, their lives were li lived. But in terms of their own, um, their own self-governing, they they could uh, they could make decisions for the community within their own four walls, so to speak. Um, uh, this is a little bit. When when uh, an individual joins an order, uh, their their let's for lack of a better word, their initiation into full membership in that order is called formation, and this is something else that is a distinguishing mark as a distinguishing characteristic as between various orders. Uh, some are longer, some are shorter. Uh, some may have, uh, the, the formation uh, framework uh, was probably slightly different in the Middle Ages than it is in modern times. Um, but for example, in the case of the Benedictines, uh, there's a, a three month period of what they call observership or uh, it's a time when there's something called discernment, whether you discern whether your vocation, vocation from the word for calling, uh, is authentic. Um, and, you know, there are retreats and there's consultations with, with um, you know, uh, 
people who uh, are advising you, etc. Uh, if you feel that this, your, your calling is authentic and you want to pursue it, then you go into a one-year postulancy, um, which involves uh, actually living in a, one of the Benedictine communities. Um, uh, and then there, that, is, that is followed by a novitiate. Uh, which is another year. And, and these are, uh, there's a gradual gradation of your involvement in the community. Uh, then that leads you for, you actually, after those first two, two and a half years of basically really making sure you want to do this, um, and uh, there's something called a simple profession. And that is uh, a, a uh, 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 a, a, it, you take a vow at that point. Uh, however, you're, it's not a final vow. It's not a final commitment. Um, uh, certainly, you're always able to leave uh, anywhere in the course of your, your uh, religious life. But at this point, you're at least ostensibly uh, uh, making that preliminary vow. Uh, and then there is, after that three years, the solemn profession. Uh, so, for example, the simple profession is that you're, you're going to, you know, at least stick it out the next three years. Um, and during those three, those three years, you're actually usually by that time wearing some version of the order's robes. And you may, uh, aside from the study aspect of it and the prayer aspect of it, you may be doing some of the apostolic work that that your that particular uh, uh, monastery or priory or abbey of the order does, like uh, being hospital chaplains or things of that nature. Uh, then at the end, you take the solemn profession, where you're basically saying, "Yes, I want this to be the the uh, way I live my life for the rest of my life." Um, and uh, so it's not like that gives you a little bit of an idea of, of, of you know, what the membership uh, process is for, for these orders. Um, the nuns, um, most of these orders have a correlate uh, system of women's convents, women's uh, living in community. And that was as early as Saint, uh, as when Saint Benedict set up, uh, you know, uh, set up his first uh, formal organization um, at uh, 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 Monte Cassino. Um, he, by legend, uh, the Scholastica was his twin sister, and she basically watched her brother doing his thing, and uh, and I'm paraphrasing the experience. Uh, and approached him that she wished to set up a similar situation uh, for a community of women. Um, now, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about uh, the nuns' trajectory and all of this, just for the sake of time. Uh, but just to be aware that, that, you know, they had their foundations, their establishments, um, and... Uh, some did, some didn't actually uh, report to the hierarchy of whatever order they were in. Some were independent, some weren't, depending on the order. As in the case of the men, uh, the male communities, um, it was a, a process of formation, then taking a vow, and living in accordance with the rules of the community. So, uh, very similar, and, and nearly all the orders, with the exception of the Jesuits, uh, had uh, had a correlate women community, uh, community of women. Um, uh, to talk at some a little bit about the uh, the how the uh, Benedictine tradition kind of moved through Western Europe. Uh, as we've said, uh, St. Benedict founded his first monastery in 527, uh, 529 rather, uh, and he went on himself to personally found uh, a dozen new little monastic communities around uh, Italy. 
But when home base was sacked by the Lombards uh, in 580, and I think at that point, St. Benedict may have passed on, uh, the monks there uh, fled south to Rome. And as Rome came under pressure uh, 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 from, the, from attacks, uh, they actually, uh, the Pope said, I want you all to head out, head to England and start sent, setting up Benedictine uh, establishments uh, in England, which they did. And I, I gather they made it on, they traveled on foot through, uh, you know, uh, across Northern Italy, uh, through France, um, you know, up to Calais or wherever they, they, they set forth across the channel. And in the course of that, uh, they would leave copies of the rules to communities that they encountered. They might have been former uh, Augustinian communities. They may have been ad hoc communities. Um, and so there's this Benedictine rule um, and this, this formalization of uh, living in this uh, uh, committed community lifestyle uh, started spreading. Um, and uh, it was one of the first, if not the first, I don't think any of the Augustinian uh, communities actually ever uh, made it, uh, were established in Britain. I think the Benedictines may have, may have been the first. I could be wrong about that. But uh, here is uh, St. Augustine's a uh, Abbey. Augustine was the leader of a little group of, of monks that were sent from Rome. Uh, in Kent, England, um, and it's now a World Heritage Site. Uh, and of course, many of the great um, Anglican uh, uh, establishments now in England were originally Benedictine establishments like Westminster, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, this is- Question? I, yes, ma'am. A question that I have is who funded the construction of these beautiful um, monasteries? Was it the monarchies at the time? It was the aristocrats. You'll very frequently see that the land is donated by the local lord or count or whomever, and they actually do fund them to get started. Now, what's the quid pro quo? Well, they were going to pray for them, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which was something people back then took seriously. Uh, and a lot of these aristocrats, aristocrats needed to have some intercession with God on their behalf since their lives were less than godly. Um, and, and then once they got started, once they had the land uh, and some initial wherewithal, again, their 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 aim was to become self-sustaining, which they did very, very well. I mean, a lot of these initial beautiful, which are now big extravaganzas, were originally just stone buildings that they themselves built. And then of course, elaborated over the years with gifts and, and, and things of that nature. But that's a good question. Well, Thank um, you. And we have another question on the chat. Um, broadly speaking, uh, Protestant, rejected uh, monasticism. Why? And yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's a good question. And that's one of those questions that I'm going to say, I don't entirely, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that there was a sense that this entire concept of s separating yourself from, from the mainstream of secular life uh, was not a valid spiritual route to go. Um, as you know, uh, Luther was actually an Augustinian monk. Um, and, uh, you know, he profoundly rejected that lifestyle. Um, together with things like uh, uh, the celibacy of the, uh, of the priesthood. Uh, so I, my guess, it was, and of course, there was, the other thing was there a lot of, by the time of Luther, um, a lot of these, uh, these, these orders had become uh, vastly enriched 
um, and very powerful politically. And there was a resentment uh, of that, uh, that they were no longer spiritual and self-sustaining, that they were indeed just another power base in the secular order. Um, and that therefore uh, it was appropriate to dismantle them. Um, of course, in England, they literally, Henry VIII, uh, you know, um, uh, literally appropriated uh, most of the monastic order's property and gave them instead to the, uh, to the aristocracy uh, to the extent that the aristocracy would then support uh, his establishment of the Church of England. Oh, no, it's just like, you know, I, 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 I said what I May I ask another question? Um, the, sure. It, it, all this prayer from Compline to Vespers uh, is presumably in Latin. Um, how good, how much did the, uh, at each stage, did, did people understand Latin? Do are they fluent? Uh, well, I, I, I would, I would surmise that certainly the monks themselves were fluent, um, uh, fluent, fluent enough to participate in the lit, you know, the the church. Oh structure. no, Ralph! What do you think of an expert? Um, oh, well, I don't know. I wouldn't say that. I think Sergio, Sergio, maybe you want to mute there. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so yeah, they were. Now, whether they were literate, reading it could be a different a different story. Oh, or writing it. And, and their level of fluency uh, may have varied. For example, I believe it or not, I'm old enough that when I grew up, the mass, the Catholic mass in you know, your local church uh, was still said in Latin. And as a kid, I knew the Latin, I knew the Latin responses, et cetera. I kind of knew what was going on in the course of the mass because I'd been to the mass every been to mass every Sunday, uh, but I couldn't read or write other Latin things in Latin. <laughs> you know? By the way, could I, could I comment on that? I've, sure. I've read a little bit about education and reading and writing dur during the Middle Ages. Uh, one one of the regular complaints is that there were a lot of the monks who were illiterate, and this was a bit of a scandal. The monks, at, at a minimum, monks and priests, at a minimum, should be able to read the gospel. I mean, they were conducting masses and so on, and I guess some of them could do it from memory, but they really were expected to read from the Bible. And so, and of course, education was primarily part of the of the church. Right. Um, I guess in England, and I think on the continent, the schools meant cathedral schools. Schools were attached to the cathedral primarily for the purposes of monks. And then the literate monks were, of course, often hired by the priests. The word clerk in, in English comes from the word cleric because it was the monks who were literate. So if the king needed somebody to keep his accounts, he would hire a cleric who would be one of the few people who were literate who could keep his accounts. In fact, the king himself was often not uh, literate. So the church, yes, the church was the center of education and Latin was the, was the language in France in particular and throughout it. Um, Latin was the only written language. If you wanted to read and write, you learned Latin. There was no written Germanic languages or written um, Celtic languages at the time. Writing meant Latin. So in France, in particular, even though, well, Gallic was the, Gallic, which is Celtic, was the original language, and then it was replaced by Germanic with the Franks, the Goths, and then, and then the Franks. Nonetheless, if you wanted to study law or you wanted to become a cleric, you had to learn Latin and then you would read and write. And gradually Latin became filtered down as the official language and gave rise to modern French. Okay, thanks. Good yeah, point. It's it, 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 worth noting that, I mean, I'm from a generation growing up in England where we all had to learn Latin. It was the compulsory subject of, it was a, just a written language, frankly. No, no one spoke it. And Latin is very complicated. It's not that easy. So, I mean, I don't think, I think in percentage, the people who understood what they were saying or what they were doing, I think was very, very minimal. 
Uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm not so sure about that, Marika. Again, uh, I I had Latin too in high school. All you know. Well, I, about, I, about Roman, but I I couldn't I couldn't really read it or understand it. But at mass, I can still tell you the uh, some of the liturgical things like Agnus Dei, Kitoli Pictoris, Mundi, Miserere Nobis, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, you know, forgive us our sins. Um, I knew what what I was saying when I said those liter those 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 phrasings in the the liturgy of the mass. Um, you know, when when I was saying those things, which I still remember, um, uh, you know, I, I understood what what the significance of it was um, and where it fell in the overall liturgy. Um, now, of course, you know, in modern times. Even in my lifetime, um, the gospel, when the, when the priest got up to say re do the readings from the gospel and to give the sermon, that was not done in Latin. That was done in English. So I think when we say what did people understand and not understand, it's a complex uh, definition of what is understanding. Um, but I, I don't think the monks were just you know uh, any given monk in the course of this you know all these prayers. Uh, the hours uh, was just standing there mumbling, uh, you know, in something that had of which he or she in the in the convent had no comprehension. I don't I don't think that's accurate. Now, could they read it? Could they read other Latin? Could they write it? That's a different story. I, I kind of think that it's more like a sing. You you sing a song, but you don't really get it because. Uh, I don't think they understood. No, you know, it always yeah. was but the whole thing about this is a mystery, the mystery of the church, the mystery of the mass. The mystery was that nobody understood, or I think we understood very little, and that was the mystery because in another yeah. language, another story, and very. Right, guys, uh, this is all. And you're right. You're right. That 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 is. Uh, that's that's a point well taken, and I, I think this has been an uh, you know important important um, aspect of this. Uh, so let's let's kind of forge on. Um, uh, let's see now, where were we right before this? Let me recollect. Uh, well, we uh, got uh, gotten up to England. Yep. Uh, uh, could I raise another? One? I, I recently read how the Irish saved civilization, which was about the development of the Irish monasteries following Saint Patrick and others. Um, and he argues that these were in the early Middle Ages, 400, 500, 600, these were the main repositories of writing and, and scholarship. And a lot of the continental uh, monasteries were strongly influenced um, by uh, Irish monks. Have you run into that in your studies? No, no, I never, it may be true. Uh, just because I didn't run into it doesn't mean it's not true. Um, I would, I would find that um, it would be interesting to pursue that that thought. Uh, but as you can see, the continental uh, monastic orders uh, were very well developed from as from as early as uh, Saint Benedict, who was actually borrowing from. St. Augustine. Um, and so this idea of preserving, you know, a, a, um, a document, in some cases documents, in other cases, a secondary um, uh, uh, interpretations of documents, particularly theologically oriented documents. Uh, I can't imagine that that came from Ireland, but that's not to say that there wasn't some special uh, preserve of knowledge that uh, Ireland uniquely uh, uh, sustained, that then sort of reverbed back to the Euro European tradition. Um, so that would be kind of my thoughts on that proposition. Uh, okay, so, um, we had talked a little bit in the prior slide about how the early Benedictines um, 
emigrated basically up to England in uh, uh, very early in the game in the 600s. Um, on the continent, I called it this this uh, fellow the other Benedict, uh, Benedict of Anian, if that's how you say it, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but this fellow actually served in the court of Charlemagne. And Charlemagne, for, for the exact reasons that Ralph pointed out, was very enamored of the Benedictines community of embedded learning, um, both in terms of preserving uh, ancient learning and uh, the continual, the idea of a continual uh, education of oneself, of the members. Uh, remember, part of the rule, uh, uh, what these people were doing between the hours were, were things like working uh, in the library or doing their own study according to whatever their superiors had uh, mandated or arranged for them. Um, and so uh, Charlemagne bought into the Benedictine rule, the Benedictine establishment of Benedictine monasteries uh, very deeply. And this, of course, uh, enhanced the status and influence of the uh, Benedictine order uh, throughout Europe and England by that time, some in, uh, up in Scandinavia, et cetera. But, but the effect of this stage in the progression is that it was almost like Constantine um, adopting uh, Catholicism. You know, it was, it was a, one of those intersections of the secular and the spiritual. Um, and uh, as, as Ralph said, uh, Bened the Benedictine uh, abbeys and monasteries, abbeys are sort of a smaller, different, ver slightly different version of a self-sustaining monastic community, have abbeys in urban areas and towns. Um, the abbeys started opening up schools or the local, Bened or the Benedictines may actually have been staffing the, ro the local cathedral, um, and and they would open up schools uh, for the you know the children in the area, the young the young adolescents, etc. Um, so at this stage of the game, uh, the Benedictines were were running running the game, running the table. Um, of course, you know, you can't talk about uh, Benedictines without talking about monasteries. And this is, needless to say, an entire uh, multi-session topic in and of itself. So I'm going to go over, I'm going to kind of glide over it relatively quickly. Um, on the right, this is a very typical arrangement. Again, these monasteries were meant to be self-sustaining uh, entities. Um, and so living in community, this is a, this is, you know, should be very, uh, should make everyone sort of recollect a Roman villa kind of arrangement, really. Um, and very, I, I've read that very often uh, these individual, uh, with a, a group of, you know, would branch out from the main monastery, they would generally be sent by the prior, you know, go set up a monastery in the next county over or something this. They would kind of scout around for some old Roman ruins and build off of that foundation. Um, but the, the concept is there's a cloister. The cloister is that square open area, which you can see on the picture, the actual photograph, that open area in the middle. Um, and usually there's a walkway around that. And often the walkway has something like stations of the cross or um, episodes from the rosary. So that as you walked around that, you would pray the rosary or pray the stations of the cross, as, as, as those liturgies are called in Roman Catholicism. It was always associated with a church, um, uh, you know, which they would call the chapel, but most, most anyone else would call a huge big church. Um, and the church would have the arrangement like we saw in that picture of the um, the, the modern day uh, Dominicans here in, in Washington, where they would they would be facing each other uh, in the main choir or main body of the church. 
Um, and then there would be a nave, a predecessory area where um, visitors could basically sit in on whatever liturgy was going on. Um, and, you know, of course, I should mention it goes without saying that daily mass was part of the liturgy. That was usually part of the, um, uh, interestingly, the afternoon, the late afternoon prayer. So that's, that's usually when mass was served. Um, the chapter house right there, that, that was sort of where the prior would have, uh, that's where the community, the members of the community would meet to just discuss administrative stuff, you know, like every community, they had regular meetings to discuss stuff like, you know, um, so-and-so is snoring too loud or <laughs> we're running out of flour or whatever the, the, uh, the aspect may have, may have been. Um, there was a course of a refectory where they all ate, which is here is labeled as a freighter. Um, and in this particular model, the abbot's lodgings, uh, the prior, you know, the head, head person there uh, was actually a separate, a separate building. Um, and they had a, um, a separate kitchen. Uh, now, this aspect of lay brothers is something I should mention that's referred to the lay brothers um, building down in the lower left. Uh, all of the orders had various sub orders, so to speak. Uh, and in its simplest forms, they had uh, the actual members of the orders, the monks, um, who may or may not be priests. Uh, although you were gonna go farther in the order hierarchy if you were an ordained priest. Um, but there was also a lay component who were called, for example, brothers. Uh, but they did not take the same solemn vows. Um, so it was sort of a different, now usually these lay brothers were the ones doing the actual work of the monastery, a lot of the sustaining work, like the laundry, um, you know, the shoveling, the actual gardening, things of that nature. Um, and so for example, when there would be these, as I mentioned, the meetings of the community in the chapter house, the lay brothers were probably not included. Um, they weren't, so to speak, voting members. Um, and of course, these monasteries were just the center of often vast properties, um, vineyards, fields, all that sort of thing. So these were operating self-sustaining communities, you know, very complex nature with a very ordered way of life um, that sustained as long as it could be sustained. Uh, this particular monastery here, this picture, I'm not sure if that's Cluny or not, but it's presently a prison in France, modern day France. So <laughs> times change. Maybe it's just a different kind of prison based on your viewpoint. Um, Anne, uh, yes, can I ask sir. a question? Sure. Um, so with, I'm not sure if it was the Benedictine monks, but were they also um, had activities such as like um, brewing cheese, uh, creating cheese and other foods and beer and, and herbal stuff like that? Was that some of the yes. things that they did in the monasteries in addition to prayer? Absolutely. Well, again, they were a community of prayer. Their life was structured by, you know, the, 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 the prayer regimen but they were also self-sustaining. So if cheese was part of their diet, they made cheese, they made their clothes. If beer was part of their diet, they brewed beer. Um, if bread was part of their diet, they, uh, they um, made bread. Now for other things like let's say fish, because they were supposed to eat fish on Fridays, uh, uh, that was the sort of thing that, that you know, uh, maybe some of their weaving activity or excess crops, they would then use to get those those things that might be external to the actual physical location uh, of the community. Um, but to as much as possible, that was basically a tenet of the rule, a tenet of the way of life was that we're self-sustaining uh, economically, as you, if you want to put it that way. Um, Great. Thank does, that you. Kind of, does that kind of get to it? So yes, no, that, that was absolutely a key grid. And, and there's a lot of contemporary studies about the technology of the medieval monasteries, you know, uh, how did they integrate? How did they, you know, 
function economically with the outside community? Um, uh, what kind of, you know, techniques did they actually excel in? And then that went out into the greater community, was adopted by the greater community for say, making cheese or making bread or making honey or the way they managed, the way they husbanded their, uh, their, their, their crops and their fields. Um, these are people that were, all, you know, were doing this in a very, um, as we would say, mindful way. They were, they would keep track of what worked and what didn't work. Um, and then those things weren't, you know, a big secret. I'm sure that morphed out into the general community. So that, again, there's an entire area of a modern study uh, approaching these communities from from that kind of perspective. Yeah, I'm not sure how true it is, but I read this somewhere. But you know the the pretzel knot that we're used to seeing, that yeah. was something that they they invented. That when they were, they were making pretzels, they it kind of symbolizes a boy praying or something like that. So not actually, not, not sure um, how true that is. Actually, may I interject? The pretzels, yes. Uh, if it was monks, I don't know, but it became a big tradition for Lent. People would hand each other pretzels. It was a symbol of someone praying, holding their hands over their heart, praying. And it was reminding you to hold the fast. You know, pretzels were very simple. They were just dough and water. Right, yeah. that's right. Yeah, there was a reminding you to hold the fast. I don't know if it was monks, but I do want to give a shout out to Dom Perignon, who I think was a monk. <laughs> <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, um, they weren't, uh, they weren't, uh, they didn't practice abstinence, um, <laughs> uh, uh, shall we say. Um, this, uh, this kind of brings us up to uh, one of the first major branching offs from the, the overall uh, Western European, uh, what was by then very well articulated ben Benedictine establishment. Um, at this point, you had sort of the normal course of human affairs, which is that some members, some members of the established Benedictine said, oh, these people have become so worldly. That's, this is not really, I don't think we're really living the life in the true spirit uh, that we should be living it. We're not being rigorous enough about our spiritual life. You know, there's too much, uh, too much secular uh, interaction. Um, some of our some of our members have become these, you know, basically secular princes in, in various uh, bishoprics, uh, et cetera. So they basically um, uh, petitioned to set up uh, a new a new uh, a new branch of the order. It might, let's say, for, of, as among the rules, it may have been essentially 80% of the Benedictine rules but had this 20% that was somehow more rigorous. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know the actual specific details, but one of these groups was uh, the group, uh, uh, the abbots of Clu uh, Cluny, who were uh, given a, a, you know, some group, core group, little group of Benedictines, uh, approached Duke William of Aquitaine in 910, and he said, that sounds good to me. I'll give you the property to set up a new monastery. And uh, Cluny, uh, with its, its somehow more rigorous observance of the rule, um, just took off like wildfire. Uh, as you can see on the map, um, they uh, the red dots are uh, again, when the, when the monastery basically reached a certain size, then it like a like a cell dividing, it would basically say, you know, as I said, the, the abbot would say, okay, you you all go set up a new a new uh, a new monastery, and it, they just took off all over Europe, and there must have been a a receptivity to their presence in the regions that they morphed into. Um, uh, so uh, Cluny evolved within its frame, which its height was around the 13th century, to one of the largest monastic establishments uh, in Western Europe. And uh, at what point um, had in all of their monasteries, uh, as it's estimated as many as 10,000 uh, uh, 10, monks. 
Um, and so, uh, so that's again, a name you may hear Clooney and it's like, well, what kind of, what kind of religious order was that? Well, they were a branch of Benedictines basically. Um, uh, another branch were the Cistercians, Cistercians. Uh, and here again, a small group, which basically saying we want to be Benedict's Benedictines, but we think we know how to do be Benedictines better. Um, branched off, got uh, got someone to uh, support them by giving them land or funds or whatever. Uh, and then they, uh, they set off on their way. Um, and I, I wish I could give you some more specific examples of what the actual differences were in the rules, but I don't know that off the top of my head. However, as I said, oddly, it was not that they wanted to, you know, like, oh, these rules are too strict. We're going to go set up something, you know, a little looser, we think a little more realistic. It was the opposite. These were, these were groups that, that were like, we think we think the the spirit has been lost, and so we want to recapture the founder's spirit. It was it was that viewpoint, um, and they they again just took off like wildfire without throughout. They they were great uh, propagators in that way. <laughs> Uh, this is an interesting um, this map on the left. I I kind of particularly uh, uh, captured it included it because. It shows you a little bit of the kind of activities to go to your questions, uh, Sergio, that these communities were operating in their self-sustaining mode. Um, you can see in the uh, northern, northern, northern parts of Europe, they were dealing in cereals. So I guess that means wheat and rye and things of that nature. Uh, in the wine growing regions of France, they were great wine growers. Um, they even did some mining. Uh, in what I guess is uh, central Germany, um, and uh, then, you know, wool and cloth, uh, particularly in England. So, uh, you know, these people were, you can see how it was an all-consuming lifestyle between the prayer and whatever activity they were, the activities they were involved in to be self-sustaining, um, it was a way of life. Now it was different from secular, you know. The the it didn't involve marriage, um, but uh, it was there were a lot of people that were willing to commit to uh, to that kind of that kind of life. Uh, so the Cistercians and the Clunies, Cluniacs as they're called, two major branches, all of which um, uh, survive to this day. Uh, in various forms, although of course a lot of them have lost a lot of their properties, and these these you know 1,000 monk abbeys like Clooney uh, monasteries like Clooney are no longer operative. I uh, am. Yes, sir. Uh, just a comment to follow up on. I think the Cistercians in particular, as you say, wanted to be more Benedictine than the other Benedictine. And as you mentioned, a lot of the monasteries had gradually evolved into having non-monks do most of the physical labor. So the monks were sort of living, living fat, as it were, on the labor of, of others. And I think the Cistercians in particular said, no, we're going to do all of our own work. We're going to tend the fields. We're going to look after the animals, shovel the manure, press the grapes, everything. So I think that's, that's right. They were going back to doing all the manual labor themselves was, I think, a key principle of the Cistercian breakaway. And I think that what that reinforced was it made their membership more cohesive and more committed um, because they were more insulated at what you could say from one perspective. Um, that's, for, you know, um, that's a problem of the modern orders. Uh, modern monastic orders, because, for example, at the Franciscan monastery near my house, uh, the uh, the monks are not maintaining the property there. You know, uh, they're basically residents there, and there's a whole other. You know, they hire people. People are, you know, landscape services, all the rest of it, laundry services, outside, you know, catering services. So they basically lost that aspect of life in community. Um, and uh, I, I, I think it can be an undermining element, but, you know, life goes on. 
uh, and you have to be realistic. Um, but again, the Cistercians were another group that very popularly took off. By the end of the 13th century, they had 500 houses. Um, so again, uh, this is all in the Benedictine, the basic Benedictine tradition, however, started by Benedict at this point, six centuries earlier. Um, uh, I thought I would include at least a couple, uh, one slide about, of course, the beautiful illustrated manuscripts that the medieval monasteries are known for. Uh, this is a very famous manuscript, uh, which I think may now be in the library, a library in England, um, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, but uh, it's called the Moralia and Job, the, the morals in, in the book of Job. Uh, and it's it's just one gorgeous uh, uh, artistic uh, expression, page after page. This uh, that's the front piece on uh, you know uh, the left there, and then some examples of you know the first letters of paragraphs being very elaborately drawn out. And obviously, this this would have been. Um, you know, quite a group effort because uh, somebody had to be thinking through the overall plan and then you would have had an entire group of, okay, you do page seven and let's talk about what the first letter of the opening paragraph is going to look like and what is the overall theme. And then also the materials they use, whatever they, these colors, whatever natural material these colors came from had to be developed and acquired and, you know, an entire expertise in that, that regard. So, uh, and of course that was done in the scriptorium of, uh, of the monasteries. Now I'm sure not all monasteries had scriptoriums, but a major uh, monastery like Citro or, or Cluny that we just saw would have a very advanced operation going on in this regard well uh, yeah just a, a couple I, th I think most of them would because of course there was no printing at this point and every monk should have a bible and if every monk has to have a bible then somebody has to uh, produce this in a scriptorium now most of them were not elaborate like the pictures you said but uh, and of course bible if bible was thumbed through every day they'd wear out so producing Bibles in the scriptoria, and they had to be done hand work, and that was a lot of work. So I think probably most of them were copying texts. Uh, that's probably right. Now, let me just clarify. Now, this is, a, this is kind of an oddity. <laughs> uh, most of the most probably did not have copies of the Bible. Uh, the Bible was not a thing for Roman Catholics. The thing was that book of the divine office. Oh. That's what they had. And they actually didn't have personal copies. Those copies were left in the chapel. And when you filed in, just as you saw all those modern day uh, Dominicans in that chapel when I was talking about divine office, the book is sitting there wherever you happen to sit in the choir stall. So by and large, they did not have personal documents, but certainly you're right. Uh, the, the chapel itself had to have a certain number of these documents, but um, no, they, Roman Catholics, oddly, up until modern, more modern times, and by modern, I mean, almost post-World War II modern, uh, are not particularly Bible oriented like the Protestants. It's the liturgy, it's the sacramental liturgy that is the core of the spiritual tradition. Um, and so it was those books, those texts that were important and that people knew. Um, Okie doke, uh, getting near to the end of the Benedictines. Um, this, I also can't go without mentioning, of course, the Crusades. Uh, Bernard of uh, Clairvaux, uh, was actually a Benedictine at, uh, he was a, a Cistercian version of the Benedictine, so the more rigorous version, who had started out in the great monastery at, at Citro that we just, that actually this is another picture of it here. Um, and he was sent to form another, you know, little satellite franchise uh, monastery, which was called Clairvaux, uh, which is from, 
apparently a norm of of the place name of Claire Valet, and he then took his name, he was subsequently called that, Bernard of Clairvaux. And this picture on the left is a very dramatized 19th century reinterpretation of when he was urging everybody on to the Second Crusade. So, uh, you know, I, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux is apparently also the one who contributed to the development of the rule of the Knights Templar as, as a military order. They went, you know, marching off to the, uh, to the Near East to do the whole Crusades thing. And uh, as I said, I'm gonna kind of beg off on the entire Crusade discussion simply because it's such a vast thing unto itself. But in terms of the religious orders and some of the people in the religious orders, this is, this is kind of who was Bernard of Clairvaux. He was a Benedictine, but he wasn't, uh, he was a special kind of uh, Benedictine. He was a Cistercian Benedictine. So you may hear him, uh, you know, referred to as uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, a Cistercian. And you're kind of thinking, well, what's a Cistercian? A Cistercian is a Benedict, a kind of Benedictine. Um, here are some of the, you know, big, well-known Benedictines. Uh, since there was such an early penetration of the Benedictine orders into England, a lot of England's uh, early, uh, uh, what shall I say, um, thought leaders, uh, particularly obviously in theology, uh, were Benedictine. So Bede the Venerable is, is 672 to 735. Um, by this time, the, the Benedictines were being appointed popes. Um, Pope Be Be uh, Be Gregory the Great was a Benedictine. Um, St. Ansel, the, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, apparently reluctantly because he did not want to live monastic life, but the king thought so highly of him that he urged the Pope to force him to accept the, uh, be, you know, the Archbishopric, uh, was a Benedictine. Um, and then people may have heard of St. Hildegard of of uh, Bingham uh, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, and uh, there's been movies about her, but she was a great abbess, a great Benedictine abbess. And, uh, uh, you know, at this point, the, uh, you know, they were, they were uh, often very aristocratic women, women from very um, aristocratic backgrounds joining the convents. Uh, and once they became abbesses, they were kind of you know, very influential. She did a lot of work uh, uh, in um, the use of herbal medicines. Uh, her particular convent, they in the gardens, etc. They did a lot of studies, which are documented, very detailed studies of the efficacy of various uh, herbs, etc., uh, in um, remediating uh, pain or sickness. Uh, a quick question. Uh, yes. Who was the competition for the Benedictines? I mean, they were the only show in town for the Clunies or, I mean, what, what was the? Well, that was, they, yeah, they were the only show in town by and large. I think it's safe to say that up until we're just getting to the point where they're not going to be so much the only show in town. But up to this point, yeah, mona a monast joining a, a monastic community meant becoming a Benedictine. Now, we talked about how the Clunies and the Cistercium were versions of the Benedictines. So yes, now a person wishing to join a monastic community may have been like, hmm, do I wanna be a regular Benedictine, which probably means I'm gonna end up more in the hierarchical side of the church after a few years in the monastery, the monastic community, I may get appointed a bishop so I could go off and be a bishop, which is a lot, you know, is a different lifestyle. Or they might say, uh -uh, I want to be uh, committed to this very rigorous, uh, uh, spiritually structured life. And so therefore, I'm going to become a Cistercian because they, 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 uh, they practice a more rigorous version or observance of uh, the original rule of St. Benedict. 
So that was a competition at that point, unless you were going to become a regular priest, you know, um, or, or uh, you know, so uh, that's the best I can answer that, Marika. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so you're welcome. I would also mention, too, about lay Benedictines. Uh, as I mentioned, these orders had kind of different parallel tracks so to speak, and you could be a lay Benedictine. Now, what does that mean? That meant that you did not live in the community, uh, although they were lay monk, there were monks who were not, you know, we talked about the lay brothers rather. These were actually regular people who uh, would basically adopt certain aspects of the Benedictine rule, particularly in terms of prayer. They might actually do some of the hours of prayer uh, on their own at home, because if you have a, that, you know, the prayer book, as I showed the pictures of earlier in the presentation, you can do it. I mean, people do it as we speak. Um, uh, and it usually involves spiritual instruction of some sort, you know, more intense spiritual instruction if you had spiritual questions by full-time Benedictines or whatever. Um, and uh, a couple of famous lay Benedictines um, are Dorothy Day, who some of you all may have heard of, a famous social worker here in the uh, 1960s in New York, uh, and also uh, writers like Walker Percy. I've also heard the Flannery O'Connor, although I'm not sure that is accurate, may have been a, a, a lay Benedictine. Um, so that was sort of, sort of, you know, like I said, a, a, a parallel track where you did kind of tap into the rhythm of the Benedictine rule, but within regu a regular secular life. And of course, lay Benedictines generally don't take, um, uh, you know, a vow of, of uh, um, I want to say, uh, abstinence uh, from marriage. Uh, and this you know, just to quickly bring it up to the present, and uh, this is an example of, this is a map uh, I found on one of the uh, OSB, Order of St. Benedict uh, websites, uh, which is tagged all the places they still have, either a monastery or a territorial abbey or a priory, uh, uh, et cetera, or a student house, um, like uh, the uh, Benedictine Abbey just up the street from where I used to live. So. They're alive and well, uh, different, but still still out there, uh, which brings us to St. Francis. Now we're going into a whole different group. Uh, now, I am not going to do justice to, uh, uh, to uh, the groups I now talk about, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and even the Jesuits, because as, as, as you can will have seen, I hope, from from what we've discussed that thus far, the uh, the Benedictines were the basic template. Uh, when you kind of get the de the Benedictine idea, the rules, the vows, the formation, the you know uh, the divine the daily structure of the divine office uh, liturgy, you you've got the basic rhythm of the monastics. Uh, now Saint Francis came along, and of course, who doesn't love Saint Francis? Um, this is a clip I love from uh, uh, a, 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 a 1950 film by uh, Roberto Rossellini uh, called The Flowers of St. Francis, which is done in, in black and white and uh, was actually all the players were monks from a, uh, an Italian uh, monastery. But what I love about this story and the reason I've included it is I think that it gives a wonderful flavor of this new Franciscan spirit. Um, and as you see, if you, if you read this down here, uh, after Rossellini completed the film, he basically said to the, to the monks, what can we give you? Because they wouldn't accept pay. And he thought they were going to say, you know, some money, as it says here in the write-up of first soup kitchen or whatever. Uh, instead, what the monks asked for were fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> they took the fireworks and had a huge fireworks display at the, um, you know, at the local town. And, uh, you know, that was a big deal. But they, there's that, that kind of joyful spirit to the Franciscans. 
that was a dramatic change from this, what had become this Benedictine behemoth. Um, uh, these are some, some scenes from the life of uh, uh, St. Francis. Uh, these are scenes that were painted uh, purportedly by Giotto, although there's some academic dispute about that, and line the walls basically of the Church of St. Francis in Assisi, which is kind of, you know, the main, the home, the headquarters, the home church of, of the order. Uh, and these these are these are really quite beautiful. The one in the upper left shows that uh, apparently, uh, you know, by tradition, um, St. Francis was a his his father was a wealthy merchant. I'm not sure he was an aristocrat per se, but he had some inspiration and he decided he passed the leper in, along the road and he gave the leper his very expensive cloak and his horse. Um, he then went to his father and said, uh, you know, I, I want to uh, become a monastic. Initially, he, he indicated his father uh, didn't like the sound of that. And so uh, the tradition is that um, uh, in escaping to the sanctuary of the local, uh, the local bishop, uh, uh, St. Francis literally took off all his clothes that his father had bought, basically, and gave them back to his father. So that makes a kind of humorous picture there. Um, the, the middle bottom is a picture of when uh, St. Francis actually petitioned to the Pope for a new rule, a rule of St. Francis for the Fr Franciscans. Uh, that The picture kind of in the upper center, that's very, I included that because it's such a uh, elegant picture, uh, portrayal of St. Francis preaching to the birds, sermon to the birds, as it's called. Uh, and on the uh, far right is a picture of uh, Saint, um, of, of when St. Francis died and, and the entire community uh, mourning his death. So he, he very quickly had a very legendary uh, aura about him. And to go back to the very beginning, the Franciscans were one of the first mendicant orders. Francis did not envision, a, he envisioned a community, a community of people, but he did not envision this community living in one of these Benedictine establishments. He envisioned a community uh, that would live in poverty, it would live totally on alms, but not aggregate property per se. They would, you know, beg for enough, seek alms for enough to sustain themselves, uh, but not to establish themselves. This, of course, was the pure early version of, of, of being a Franciscan. And as you all know from your, your familiarity with medieval history, uh, this would have been a breath of fresh air. And what it was being particularly in the 13th century being perceived as an establishment, a church establishment that had become entirely too worldly, entirely too rich, entirely too oblivious to their actual spirituality. Um, and uh, he just, the, the concept took off uh, tremendously. Um, he, like the Benedictines, um, it was the same structure. There was a rule of life established, which St. Uh, Francis drew up, that was approved by the Pope, so it was approved order within, the religious order within the Roman Catholic hierarchy. Um, he had three different sub-orders, so to speak. The Friar, Friars Minor, which he very humbly named the Minor, but they were the actual core members of the communities. Then there was the um, women's adjunct, so to speak, who were called the poor Clares, and then there were brothers and sisters of penance who were, I think this is correct, uh, lay, lay, uh, the lay adjunct of the order. Um, and they're also referred to as first, second, and third orders of St. Francis. Um, mentioning the Clares, uh, St. Clare of Assisi, unlike St. Scholastica, was, who was 
uh, St. Benedict's tw- twin sister. St. Clair was actually, had no relation uh, uh, to uh, uh, St. Francis, but she got wind, I'm sure among young people, this was some new thing that got out there and known. She was very enamored of it, and she decided she wanted to start a community of of women who lived by the uh, by the Franciscan rule of poverty, uh, uh, and uh, so, however, it was a little different for women, or at least it was perceived to be different for women, that women would live in a convent. They weren't going to be just out there traveling the roads of Italy. Um, but in any event, so uh, you will hear of uh, the poor Clares as being the uh, Franciscan nuns um and that's that's a pretty that's a uh, uh it's not a mural those are um i believe actually uh, embedded tile work there um which kind of you know uh, gives a legendary viewpoint of when she first approached uh saint francis to to make this parallel uh women's community um a brief word about Franciscan formation. These these are the rules of Saint of Saint Francis. Uh, formation we'll see is pretty. It's very similar now in all of the orders. There's a postulancy period when you're doing discernment. Then there's a novitiate period, a post novitiate period, all leading to salt, you know with inter intermediate levels of vows, all culminating in a solemn profession of vows or a lifetime commitment, basically. Um, uh, so that's Franciscan. Uh, uh, did the Franciscans have monasteries? Uh, yes, obviously they do. Um, uh, there's the Franciscan monastery near to where I lived out in Brooklyn. Um, however, as I said, that was not their focus. They were not going to be oriented towards monastic life. Their life was to get into, almost like the original uh, rule of St. Augustine or thought of St. Augustine, they were going to live in communities, either in the rural areas, in the towns, or even in the more urban areas, and practice uh, a way of life, uh, a humble way of life that, that didn't have the aggrandizement of vast monastic properties, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, however, for the poor Clares, uh, this is a, another picture from the Church of Assisi, another uh, uh, painting uh, purportedly by Giotto, of uh, it, there was a broken down church near Assisi uh, in which, uh, say, uh, by legend, St. Francis stopped to pray and he heard the voice of God who said, go and repair my church. Uh, this was a church called a uh, broken down church called San Damiano, uh, which uh, by legend, um, uh, St. Francis did after this inspiration and, you know, got his brothers and they literally with their own hands uh, rebuilt this church to the, to the point where it could be used by the uh, poor Clares. So there is always this concept in these, at least the medieval forms of these communities that they, you know, here, instead of going out and seeking alms to hire people to refurbish this old church, they actually did it themselves. So, uh, you know, a, a different viewpoint. Um, however, they got into big time monasteries as well as the, as the generations progressed. Um, I should mention that the Franciscans uh, were given what is called the custody of the Holy Land. And actually, um, uh, part of the legend of St. Francis is that he traveled to Egypt. And uh, there's, a, again, a depiction of that episode of his life uh, there on the right about him uh, appearing before the Sultan al-Kamil of Egypt. Um, and given that, that middle, Mideastern connection, uh, that, that's partially why, as time went on, they were... The Franciscans came to be identified uh, with the Mideast, and they ultimately, by papal bull, were awarded, uh, designated to be custodians of the uh, Christian uh, 
sites of importance in uh, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Ner uh, Nazareth, etc. And uh, you know, in the uh, uh, more in the uh, 16th century, they actually built uh, some major monasteries there. One of which is the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And again, this would have been through donations. Um, and uh, the monastery that was near me uh, is actually a branch that was built, I think, in the 1920s over there to be a rep uh, a a representative, uh, sort of a parallel of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to remind people in America to uh, of what what the Franciscans were responsible for in the Holy Land and to promote donations for the upkeep and sustenance of those. Uh, the monastery is, is, is very beautiful. The grounds are actually gorgeous, uh, you know, rose bushes, every kind of horticultural beauty you can think of. It's a large, large, large property. And inside the church, interestingly, they have a lot of replicas of uh the the uh the sites in Jerusalem uh like the the interior of the church of the holy sepulcher so if you're ever in washington it's well worth stopping by once we get post covid uh some famous franciscans uh well william of ockham dun scotus uh sir thomas more who was actually a lay franciscan uh, third order Franciscan, uh, since of course he was married, it was a chancellor of England, etc. William of Ockham actually was, uh, who's known for Ockham's razor, uh, was a Franciscan who was excommunicated by the Pope because he was espousing uh, an, a radical form of poverty of life. Uh, he was going back to the early biblical stories of where the uh, early Christian communities held everything in uh, in a shared fashion. Um, and he was proposing that all of Christian society should be like that, not, not just the religious orders. And the Pope basically said, no, that's not really church doctrine. And, you know, um, Ockham, William of Ockham said, yeah, well, it should be. And then the Pope apparently had him sort of semi-imprisoned uh, in some some monastery, and William of Ockham escaped from there and left. And that's what he was technically excommunicated for, was disobedience to the order of the Pope to stay there. And he subsequently uh, set up his own little radical branch. Um, his mentor was Dun Scotus, who was actually Scottish, but again, these famous sort of theological uh, theologians. Uh, these were some examples of, of um, Franciscans. So the Franciscans weren't all about alms. They also had that study and learning aspect component to their, their life and community. Um, some more modern Franciscans, uh, there are many Franciscan popes, was Pope Pius X, who was uh, the period just prior to World War One, he was notoriously antithetical to all the pomp that had grown around the papacy at that point. Um, uh, again, in good, although he actually was also a third order Franciscan, he had never joined the Franciscan order as a full Franciscan. He had been a diocesan priest for uh, nine years, and then he joined the third order. Um, so that was sort of a layering on his uh, diocesan priesthood. And on the right, we have the famous Mother Angelica, at least famous in Catholic circles, who started up that cable television network, EWTN. She was a nun of the poor clerics, although she had kind of, again, the nuns like the, like the men uh, all had sort of slightly different iterations over the years of certain communities. And she was a a particular iteration of poor, of poor Claire's. Which brings us to, uh, oh, a final note about the Franciscans. Uh, the Franciscans uh, kind of uh, bifurcated into a number of branches over the generation. And so uh, they, it's, when you, when someone says they're Franciscan, you know, 
the, the basic Franciscan, shall I say, is wearing a brown robe with a, a, ro a white rope around uh, his waist, or in the case of the nuns, white, with three knots in it for the uh, three, the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. However, you, in, in England, they became something, they kind of uh, uh, changed it up a little, and they wore gray robes, and they were called gray friars. Um, and they have all the, among the first order now, there's, there's observance, conventuals, and capuchins that you may have heard of. Um, and so, so that, that tree, this tree was a good pic, uh, depiction of how, how these orders, as they've gotten larger, have, you know, divided and, and propagated over, uh, over the globe now, really. And actually, uh, uh, the uh, Franciscan International, which is apparently a corporate entity, is uh, holds a seat at the United Nations, which is interesting. So again, like the Benedictines, they're still they're still in the game in modern times. Uh, which brings us to the Dominicans. Now, the Dominicans uh, were formed uh, pseudonymously by Saint Dominic. Um, Saint Dominic uh, was really a contemporary. He was a younger contemporary of Saint Francis, uh, and he too uh, was not attracted to the the pomp and power of the established Benedictine order. Uh, he decided his emphasis, Saint Francis's, was that 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 as we as Catholics would say, a charism of humility. Uh, Dominic was interested in preaching. At that time, and this is Zach brought up the Cathars, the Cathars and other you know heretical groups uh, uh, from Rome, mainstream of Roman Catholicism uh, were uh, were uh, getting a, a big following. And so the church and the Pope, they thought, you know, we need these these folks. Uh, this needs to be stopped. And Dominic's uh, feeling was that by stop, it meant that they had to be preached to and convinced by the preaching of the error of whatever their uh, schismatic doctrines uh, were. Uh, in the case of the Cathars, they kind of drew from an old Gnostic tradition, um, which you know. Sounds sounds good. And Dominic, who was born in Spain, uh, not you know not Italy, uh, uh, brought together his own you know put together his own order. Basically, it was the usual three levels: the the main order of friars preachers or order of preachers, as I've said. They they would have o they have O P after their name. Um, a parallel line of uh, women's communities and then a lay order or third order. Um, uh, Dominic had first become aware of the uh, Cathars uh, prior uh, to his forming his own order when he was still a, just a regular diocesan priest, when he had gone in a, a, some sort of diplomatic mission and had observed the uh, Cathars. Uh, and in setting up his rule, he, he established, as I have this quote here, that uh, our order, i.e. the Dominicans, were established principally for preaching and for the salvation of souls. Well, that leads into, uh, uh, he, you know, again, the, the organization grew surprisingly fastly. Uh, it started off with six followers. They didn't start a monastery. They started in a house uh, in Toulouse. Um, and then, you know, over the course of the next decade, they, uh, they grew very rapidly uh, and were recognized, uh, recognized order by the Pope. But that preaching, that Cather's experience, uh, Dominic's uh, focus on, on using preaching to show these folks the error of their ways, the supposed error of their ways, uh, led to their involvement in the infamous Inquisition. Now, the, there's 
there's academic dispute about whether Dominic did or did not himself participate in inquisit inquisitional activities as we think of them in modern, as we look back on them in modern times. Certainly he was aware of the Cathars, certainly he had adopted this approach of this is why we need to be good preachers with good theological foundations, because we need to be able to engage with schismatics and show them the error of the ways. That is something short of what the later acquisition, inquisition used to change people's minds, which was torture and death. Um, at, officially, Dominic died about 10 years before the first uh, inquisition was formally declared by the Pope. So. Again, there's whether he himself was or was not involved in those kind of more um, nefarious uh, uh, phases of the Inquisition is in question, but technically he was not. Uh, however, there's no question that the Dominicans were, were totally, uh, they were basically designated by the Pope to, to run the Inquisition. And uh, something I had not been fully aware of, there were several phases of the uh, of the Inquisition. It wasn't just one thing. There's what was called the Medieval Inquisition, which is this one that started in the uh, the 1200s, around the, just after Dominic uh, died. Um, and then there was the Spanish Inquisition. Now, according to what I read, and I'm sure there's disputes about this, the first in phase of the Inquisition, the Medieval Inquisition, was primarily focused on uh, errant former Ca Roman Catholics. Um, and, and so anyone who was you know, flirting with being a Cathar or whatever, those were the people that were targeted um, and brought in for um, you know, teaching. And if they were, didn't, uh, didn't respond to the quote teaching, then you know, more and more forceful uh, forceful pressure was involved. Um, and, and uh, you know, uh, this, uh, these Cathars had themselves morphed into groups while, like the Waldensis and the Albigensians. And these are groups that, uh, again, went back to an older Christian Gnostic tradition, um, rejected the church hierarchy, rejected sacraments uh, within the church framework, which of course right there is is a game is a is a deal breaker uh, for for the Catholic hierarchy, etc. Torture was allowed, um, but it was not focused on not at, again from what I read on non Christians at that phase that initial phase of the acquisition. But uh, very clearly, uh, uh, Pope Gregory by what's called the papal bull, which is like a papal edict place the operation of the Inquisition uh, into the hands of the Dominicans. And it occurred primarily in southern France and Spain because that's, while, that's where the Cathars, Cathars and the Albigenians were, and I think some of these Waldensians as well. Um, the second phase, this, what's called the Spanish uh, Inquisition, uh, was about uh, 200 years later. Uh, it was under the auspices of the uh, the Spanish king and queen, Ferdinand and Isabella. And that, again, from what I've read, is where it became a much, much nastier affair. Um, and that is where uh, Jewish and the Jewish and the Muslim uh, communities were targeted. And uh, it seems that the a lot of times it was really for the purpose of appropriation of their property, um, and so this had this had become this had you know gotten completely out of hand. Uh, uh, however, the the uh, the Dominicans were still thoroughly involved. Uh, the famous uh, head of the Spanish Inquisition, Torquemada, Tocuma, uh, was was a Dominican, um, and I was interested to find that. Uh, phases of the Spanish Inquisition as, a, as an institution, i.e. an institution for calling in people who uh, uh, were outside of church doctrine, um, uh, continued on to as late as Napoleon. 
um, where when Napoleon or one of his brothers, I guess Joseph, uh, is, uh, entered into Spain and took over Spain, uh, they actually still found um, uh, people in, in uh, you know jails of the of the Inquisition. So. There's no question that's a major blot on uh, the Dominican tradition um, and one which, uh, you know, I'm sure they regret uh, in present times. Well, of course they regret, in they need to regret in present times. Um, uh, just a quick word about Dominican formation, because of their emphasis on uh, preaching, they had a, a, a more rigorous emphasis on uh, academic academic um, uh, achievement within the pre-final vows phase. Uh, you have to, and these are present requirements, but uh, you have to actually uh, ob obtain a master's in theology. Uh, and if a priesthood candidate, also a master's in divinity. Many of the Dominicans, of course, uh, go on to PhDs, hence the Dominican House of Studies, near a Catholic University, for example. Uh, but just just a longer process with, with, this, with this more uh, academic emphasis. Uh, this is just a picture. Again, uh, the Dominicans grew very rapidly. Uh, uh, St. Dominic started with only 16. Within a few years, there were 60 establishments. Now, again, the Dominicans were a mendic, what is called a mendicant order, like the Franciscans, in the sense that they did not establish these big Benedictine-like monasteries. They lived in houses in the city or towns or priories, smaller priories, etc. And they could move around from one priory or place to another. Uh, they organized themselves in what were called provinces. And again, over the course of within just a, a hundred year period, less than a hundred year period or a hundred year period, uh, they, they'd gone from the original 16 uh, to over 600 such establishments. So, Again, there must have been a lot of people at that period of time who were uh, interested in a, a, these alternative lifestyles. You might, you uh, modern, a modern uh, characterization might be. Um, a quick yes. question: Were yeah. these, these priests? They were all able to do the mass, and if you were a believer at the time, you would prefer to go to the Dominican Church than the. Franciscan or was always Latin and, you know, the Dominican Franciscan or anything that didn't make much difference? Uh, yeah, no, the, the Dominicans in the course of their formation uh, do, do become priests uh, uh, and they can serve mass and they serve mass in their own chapels, just like this, the Dominican House of Studies uh, that I showed you the picture of where, where they were singing uh, divine office. Um, as to preferences of the la laity, as it's called, people like me, uh, you're basically welcome wherever you feel comfortable. It's the same mass. The mass is the mass. They, they don't have different versions of the mass. So it's always uh, the same, regardless. Yeah, of the order of the mass. Forgive me for interjecting. No, I'm a Catholic too, by the way. Yeah, Louisa, yeah. Louisa, and I'm a Catholic too, Anne. But <laughs> okay. uh, the order of the mass is the same worldwide. I don't care where you go, and I've gone to masses all over the world. The order is the same. It will be in the local language, so you may not speak the language, but the order is the same. So you, the things will happen yeah. in the same order at the mass. That's right. And and why you might choose one, you know, a Benedictine a mass in a Benedictine chapel versus a Franciscan chapel uh, can be either one just of practicality, because um, like you're saying, you might be traveling around. So you look around, where's who, where's somebody saying mass that I can attend to fulfill fill that liturgical obligation? Uh, or you might just prefer a Franciscan um, uh, uh sermon rather than a Benedictine sermon or a Dominican sermon. A Dominican a sermon by a Dominican might be a little more cerebral, talking about 
theology and church uh, church doctrine in that regard, whereas a Franciscan a sermon by a Franciscan is going to be more about you know nature and peace and harmony. So, uh, but the basic mass is the same that they're they're uh, they're offering as it's called. But that's a good question. Yeah. So anyway, I have that, another sure. Just another another question uh, having to do with the Dominicans. Um, in modern times, have the Dominicans or the um, or I guess it's truly the Dominicans uh, have come have come to um, regret the atrocities that were performed um, back at the time of uh, Ferdinand and Isabella and prior as well. I understand that it was through uh, uh, through the the P Pope Gregory um, and they essentially did his dirty work for him but has there ever has this significant uh, immoral immorality ever been um, discussed and resolved? Uh, that is a good question, and I'm glad you asked it. Uh, and it was to tell you the truth, it was one of the things I was going to look up uh, just as I was finishing up this presentation, and I didn't which was to see if they've ever uh, uh, formulated an, a, a, an official acknowledgement and apology for this. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, all I can well, say I'm, is- I'm, I'm interested in actually pursuing it because it, it's always been a source of fas fascination how people of goodwill can do such great harm? Uh, well, I, 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 this is a fascinating topic for sure. Repellent, but fascinating topic. Uh, I, in, the, the, in you know, some of the research I did for the presentation, as I mentioned in the prior slide, um, it really makes you queasy to realize that in the Spanish ex version of the Inquisition, uh, Inquisition uh, some of the motivation was plain old greed. Uh, they were appropriating the Jew Jewish and the Muslim communities' property, uh, you know, presumably for the advertisement of the church. And, and, and the antithesis of, of the basis, really, of uh, the three major religions. May I, may oh. I interject? I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Beverly, is it Beverly that you were just asking the questions of the apology? Yes. Uh -huh. in, I looked it up quickly. I just went through the internet for you quickly. Uh, and in Good. 2000, John Paul II apologized for the sins of Roman Catholics made in the name of their faith, including abuses during the Inquisition. So now I don't know if fleshed out what that means, but there is something in the news there. Oh, thanks uh, so much, Louisa. So start Googling, Beverly, and see what you can do. Yeah, well, apology. thank you. Thank you. Church, it'll be it'll be interesting for me. If they've me made to... any other after that, what have they have done about it? You know, it's just that apology. Because oh, I've always seen it as so diametrically opposed. Uh, it, you know, in the name of religion, um, such evil has has gone on. No, that's you're you're absolutely right about that, and it it is. Um, how could how could people of that time uh, have reconciled that? Right, we would exactly. Call it, we would call it cognitive dis dissonance in their mind. <laughs> and I hate to say it, but human, you know, these communities are all human communities. <laughs> they're a different way of living, but they're still comprised of humans. And so unfortunately in that period, the human the human uh, vice of greed, I think, and antipathy to people uh, not cohering to whatever your beliefs are, um, overtook what should have been the core spirituality to transcend those kind of human vices. Yes, the core spiritual a huge virtues. discrepancy. 
And I, I think it's also based on ig ignorance because um, <clears throat> there were the same period of time, there was a lot of good things going on. But when all this is based on ignorance and something that you have to believe without any, you know, question. So that's where things, horrible things happen. I think if these people were more educated or they have a way of questioning things instead of acting based on obedience to something that... Okay. Excuse me. Could, uh, do you hear me? Could I say something? Yes. Okay. My name is Olga and my friend long, long ago actually read for, he's a philosopher and he read uh, uh, all these documents, not all, some documents of inquisition for his, I guess, for his project. And what he is saying and what I understood, it was not that simple. They actually, what they wanted, they wanted these people to save their soul and, because, and they did not care about body, body anyway die. And these people did not want uh, from their point of view save their soul. So they, it's not what, it was not a torture. It was make people submit to God rule. There was in this time, there was a lot of, so they, from their point of view, they, actually did not enjoy it. They try to save people's soul from, again, from their point of view. And at this time, there was a lot of other people who harm themselves, make pain to themselves to kind of be together with Christ and again, save their soul. So it was much more complex than just torturing and getting property. I, I think though, and this is for a whole other discussion, at the same time, you had Christopher Columbus sailing yeah, to what he right. thought was, you know, all of this occurring simultaneously. And I don't think that um, death was ever a cause for killing innocent people was ever uh, a precept of, uh, of religion. Mm. Yeah. But if I may also add, uh, you know, when the expulsion of Jews happened, by the, by the way, the same day, the same year, uh, Christopher Columbus you know, went to America, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, most of the Jews stayed and converted on, on the uh, smaller part of the Jews were, because they were given a choice, uh, uh, left. So one of the uh, purposes of the Spanish Inquisition was to uh, weed out those who did not convert wholeheartedly, who uh, uh, secretly uh, uh, continued to practice uh, Judaism or Islam, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, all the, all the uh, Muslims were expelled at the same time. Uh, so that, that, that was uh, one of the things. And uh, it's interesting that I, I've read uh, some of the DNA uh, in Spain, and they're saying that mm -hmm. uh, about 15 to 20 percent of DNA of, Sp of Spanish people right now are Jewish. Mm -hmm. Isn't that well, interesting? Well, some of the great uh, uh, subsequent uh, Roman Catholic saints like Teresa of Avila were converso families, as they were called. Yeah, and they were called Maranos, as you, as you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, those converts, which means actually pigs. Mm. It's thought that Franco was a descendant of Jews, too. Yeah, but, but a, a lot of them, they, they mixed later on, they lost, a lot of them conversed for, for, for real, and they lost, and they mingled, and eventually, right now, on average, they estimate, uh, you know, that between 15 to 20 percent of uh, 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 Spanish DNA is Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, Anne, can I ask you, regarding the Spanish history with Catholicism, um, do you know why like say this very high state Catholicism that was perpetrated by Franco, um, 
why is there why was there such an extreme religiosity in Spain of Catholicism such that it permeated the state? I mean, it was it was practically a theocracy under Franco. Well, you know, I'm not a specialist on Franco, but I can say in general with regard to Spanish history, I think it's because there was in the Iberian Peninsula, you had Muslims, Jews, and, uh, you know, Catholics. Um, and that, that in the medieval, medieval period, um, each of the, the Catholic community felt threatened by the other two communities. And of course, the Muslim community uh, wanted to retain the uh, footing that it had gained historically in the southern half of Spain. So it gave, it gave rise to this great clash of cultures over property and to achieve, you know, the ultimate unification. Um, you know, uh, uh, Queen Isabella, that was one of her major things. And I think that just permeated a, a, a Spanish cultural way of thinking so that whenever there were new elements in the society, of course, at the time of Franco, it was liberal political uh, elements versus uh, established political elements. There was this reaction that was, was um, uh, blended in with religion. Uh, this idea that, you know, that, uh, you know, Spain is a Catholic kingdom, Spain is a Catholic country. What they're really saying is Spain was this uh, non-Islamic, uh, non-Muslim, non-Islamic, non-Jewish portion of the culture, which, you know, was, of course, was, was you know, wrongheaded thinking. But I, I think that's why it, it has to do with that historic, you know, historical tension that was always present in Spain uh, as, as the Iberian Peninsula and who was going to dominate the Iberian Peninsula. And, and I think also uh, the church supported Franco in the Spanish Civil War uh, yes. uh, very much and uh, 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 he had to share power. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised at that because, of course, the the the, the antipathy was they weren't just liberals; they were viewed as communists. So the church was always anti-communist. Um, yes. For whatever reason. Uh, in any event, if if that kind of we can, everyone's okay to go on. Uh, kind of finishing up the Dominicans. Did the Dominicans, even though they were mendicant orders. They did establish monasteries uh, or large ecclesiastical communities, basically. And rather than go into, you know, enumerations, I just did a search on Dominican monasteries and took a screenshot of all the pictures that came up. So um, even though they were mendicant, but here again, in the Dominican orders, those monasteries would simply have been places of retreat or places of uh, formation, you know, for postulants, etc. They weren't those self-sustaining Benedictine kind of communities. Uh, uh, so, Dominicans. A couple of, just to end up, a couple of famous uh, Dominicans. Uh, of course, Thomas Aquinas. <clears throat> Again, uh, since Aquinas, who was shortly after uh, 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 Dominic, uh, you know, he was almost like second generation of, of Dominican. He was attracted to the Dominican order because he was attracted uh, to, uh, I presume, I'm speculating, but he always had a theologic, the, theological slash philosophical bent of mind. And the Dominicans were staking out that aspect of uh, the Roman Catholic culture at, for themselves as the great thinkers and formulators, even though, as we've seen, there were very many Benedictine and Franciscan thinkers of that sort. Uh, but Thomas Aquinas is obviously a high point. Um, you know, he's the, he's the Dominican um, superstar. This picture shows him, uh, I presume, with uh, a depiction of his, his largest work, the Summa Theologica, 
Uh, that church he's holding, the convention of portraiture, uh, when this was done in the 15th century, that must have been a particular church that he was associated with, although he was never a, uh, a church rector. He was always assigned to either the University of Paris or some of the, um, you know, scholarly enterprises in uh in Rome, in Vatican City. He kind of bounced back and forth at the, the behest of the Pope uh, to some extent. Um, he had, his, his mentor was uh, Albert, Albertus Magnus, Thomas the Great, uh, another Dominican. And so uh, very quickly, uh, just as the Franciscans uh, attracted people who were um, uh, drawn by that charism of humility. Uh, the Dominicans attracted uh, people who were uh, interested more in uh, theological speculation and formulation of, of, of uh, philosophical um, uh, abstractions, so to speak. Um, and it's, uh, that is the reason that this, this, this school of thinking, this era, this 13th century era uh, is known as scholastics because uh, these, were, these were religious orders. They were monks, they were Dominican monks, but instead of being in a monastery, instead of being out in the community doing, uh, you know, um, works of charity like the Franciscans, they were embedding themselves in what the emerging universities of Western Europe uh, so that, uh, you know, obviously with the name that the Catholic framework, the Roman Catholic framework would, uh, they were trying to sustain the Roman Catholic framework as the framework of um, academic, uh, academic thinking. Um, uh, so as new things came along in Aquinas's case, like the, 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 via Spain and via the uh, Muslims in Spain, with, uh, Europe was beginning to receive uh, Aristotle's works. Um, uh, this, uh, instead of banning that work uh, as, you know, uh, uh, not coherent with Catholic, um, Catholic dogma, uh, uh, men like Aquinas and Albert Magnus were attempting to harmonize. In other words, Aquinas would read uh, elements of uh, Aristotle and then show how they comported with uh, Christian authority like the Bible, like the great writers like Augustine uh, and with uh, Christian revelation. So uh, that was quite a project and it's the project that um, produced to this day as an object of academic interest, i.e. the Summa Theologica, and of course, Albert Magnus's work too. Uh, which brings us to the last of the four, the last but not least, the Jesuits. Um, this, is, this is a portrait of St. Ignatius Loyola, who was the founder of the Jesuits. Um, he was Spanish. Uh, he was from a Spanish the Spanish aristocratic level of Spanish society. He was, uh, he, he deemed himself a knight, uh, it, you know, it, by, the, by the time he was born in the early 1600s, of course, there weren't, many, there weren't actual knights out on horses and doing jousts, but the families had very proudly maintained that tradition that their forebears had been, had, had, had been knights of various sources and that title would be handed down. So he, he viewed himself as a knight. He underwent a spiritual conversion um, uh, as we see so often in the sort of, you know, biographical, the legendary biographies of these founders, of fa founders of many organizations. And he decided that he would be a knight, uh, but a knight for the Pope, that they would be uh, sold, the Pope soldiers, so to speak, not in a physical military sense, but in sort of a diplomatic sense. Um, they become sort of those, uh, community, uh, 
which I say, an order of of uh, committed religious, uh, an order of religious committed to sustaining the interests of the church at the behest of the Pope. Um, let's see what I do. I've got them wrong, going the wrong direction. Um, he established the order um, with two colleagues uh, and um, uh, Peter Faber and Francis Xavier. So, you know, Francis Xavier and Loyola, how many high schools in America are named after, and universities are named after uh, those folks? Um, I actually have the wrong dates here. I had the wrong dates on the prior slide. Uh, Ignatius Loyola was 1491 to 1556. Um, so a little earlier than I indicated. But um, uh, they took from the beginning, they were not a monastic order, not a mendicant order. They are, are operate almost as independent priests. Uh, who only live together when it's it's practical. They can either live alone or they can live with a group of other priests. It all depends on whatever particular uh, mission they're on, so to speak. And they they specifically added in their constitution um, a fourth vow uh, in addition to the traditional. Uh, poverty, chastity, and obedience, a vow of obedience to the Pope as the sovereign pontiff. And this came to, it's not, you know, coincidental that this emerged at the time of the Counter-Reformation, where I think the Catholic hierarchy, and this is, you know, my, my thoughts on it, the Catholic hierarchy was obviously no longer inseparably entwined with this, the uh, secular power structure as it had been in medieval times. All of a sudden, in places like Germany, uh, kings and, and you know, rulers, secular sovereigns of that sort were saying, we don't need to be uh, deigned by the Pope. We don't need to be uh, chose, you know, given the okay by the Pope to be sovereign. Um, uh, we, you know, the church may still be a wonderful thing for the, span the spiritual, but uh, the secular can, can, can separate itself from that, that dominance of that structure. And needless, you know, needless to say, that would be threatening. Uh, threatening to the extent of not only might they not have the same dominance, i.e. the church may not have had the same dominance over the secular, uh, but they may actually have be, would emerge to being threatened by the secular, of losing properties, of losing, um, you know, certain privileges and perquisites. And so I think this is where the Jesuits saw themselves as stepping in, just as the Dominicans were, you know, the Franciscan stepped in to to reintroduce humility into the church. The Dominican stepped in to introduce sophisticated preaching and theological thinking to combat non non dogmatic um, uh, emergences in their their societies. The the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, you will see after a Jesuit, he has S.J. He, uh, after his name, were sort of the diplomats from the Pope to the, the secular world to protect the Pope's interests. Now, this is a this is a gross uh, simplification and overgeneralization because uh, uh, this is such an incredible, crazy thing because you are saying <laughs> that you are going to obey something that you are not going to question anything. I mean, this is like going, I, 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 for me, so hard to understand how anybody can rationalize this. I mean, how can you say you're going to obey forever something that you don't know what it is? Um, I, I, well, I, you know, I think you raise a good point, Marika, to the extent that it is faith-based. There's no doubt about that. 
Um, you know, now different people had different levels of faith and faith is not always a sole motivator for the actions of individual humans within the overall church community, but it is a community that believes as a matter of faith, uh, certain to them truth. Um, uh, and, and yeah, it's hard to, could, if you don't, it's hard to understand. Could I, could I ask a question? I will cross the street and I will close my eyes. I will cross the street and I will close my eyes. I mean, it's for me so hard to. Yeah, it, yeah. I, I mean, I, under, I, I certainly appreciate how that seems incomprehensible. And may I ask a question? Uh, do you think uh, that this Jesuit order was formed as a reaction to the Protestant movement? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, what, they, what the Catholics called the counter-reformation, uh, uh, which was embodied in the Council of Trent. Um, all of that was on the heels of Luther, um, you know, in England, Henry VIII, which is a little bit earlier, but it was this entire wave of uh, people basically um, leaving the Catholic Church and accessing the tenets of Christianity in completely separate ways. Um, and yeah, I, I think that, but as I said, I think, you know, the entire church would have been concerned about that. You know, the parish priests, the Benedictines in their monasteries, normal laity. However, I think the Jesuits said, let's, let's particularly look at this from the secular power point of view. And again, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing and speculating my own thoughts on this, which I'm sure any good Jesuit would find abhorrent. But um, I think they were, they were basically saying, let's make sure the, the church's interests are protected. These sovereign entities may go secular or Protestant, uh, which would seem, it, but let's make sure that we, it's sort of like American diplomats going to foreign countries and the foreign countries can do what they want but the diplomats are there to make sure that what they do is not harmful to United States interests, hopefully, and can even be somehow harmonized with American interests. That's kind of what the Jesuits were, were I think, aiming towards uh, in, as their, their role in, in the overall church world of the Roman Catholic Church. So that's, that's why you always have this, this um, this you know tradition of of Jesuits uh, being being in there uh, being in a society uh, that might not you know that that uh, might be a Protestant society but you know kind of surreptitiously undermining that that uh, let's say predominantly Protestant society that's why they were periodically um, thrown out of uh, England because they were they were seen as as somehow undermining the the Anglican established society. Um, however, I should hasten to add that the Jesuits are all priests. Uh, they often they 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 have formed. They had a huge teaching function because, of course, that would have been kind of in that same vein about educating young people into the thought of the of the protection of the church, um, or at least. Uh, fealty to the church. Um, and hence, you have Georgetown University, which is also in Washington, but it's in the other side of the city from the Catholic University uh, community. Um, and they staff parishes, you know, they do parish work where they're, they're assigned to a parish and they have their schedule of masses they have to be there to say, uh, and all that sort of thing. But uh, Again, and I'm sorry to interject. Yeah, I know the sure. Jesuits as Catholics, we see the Jesuits, or at least I've seen them always, as the most uh, intellectual and liberal of priestly orders. They do a ton of missionary work over centuries. Uh, there's a lot of well known ones that have been everywhere, influential in, in far reaches of the world. And to this day, uh, often I've encountered a lot of priests from a lot of orders 
And I have to say my favorites are the Jesuits. <laughs> so, well, uh, no, no, uh, and you, yeah. your, your, your point is well taken, Louisa. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I concur with oh, you. Oh, and by the way, Pope Francis is a Jesuit. Just wanted Wait to Wait a minute, you just <laughs> took out, you just took away my oh, last- I took the thunder, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, the last slide was going to be bad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, no, that's fine. That's fine. We're getting, we're getting, we're rolling down the hill now. Um, a couple of Q and A's. Do Jesuits live in monasteries? They're not a monastic order. They live where they work. Um, parishes, schools, apartments, wherever that may be. Um, do Jesuits pray the divine office? Uh, praying the divine office is not in, in community, as was done in the monasteries, and it's even done by the Dominicans and the Franciscans, is not part of the rules of uh, Ignatius Loyola. Now, they individual, I don't know to what extent, I don't know how the prayer life, a, a Jesuit, individual Jesuit structures his prayer life, uh, but it may include or may not include, but it's not required. Um, and they are priests, Marika, so they do say mass. Um, are there Jesuit nuns? Nope, no Jesuit nuns. There, there are Benedictine nuns, there are Franciscan nuns, there are Dominican nuns, but there are no Jesuit nuns. Um, I don't know what that says, but there it is. Uh, as for the, this goes, this goes to Louise's point, the formation for a, the priesthood as a Jesuit, in other words, to become a full Jesuit can take from eight to 17 years. Um, they are, you know, uh, there's academic, over the left, you can see there's academic uh, formation as well as the whole, you know, discernment period. Do you have a true vocation? Do you have a true vocation for living as a Jesuit? Um, and then they go through various stages of uh, doing, you know, their various uh, Jesuit ministries. Um, as described, as, like, as, as uh, Louisa described, um, and you know, then there's 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 final ordination um, after this protracted period of quote formation quote. So to become a full fledged Jesuit is uh, is quite an achievement and quite a commitment, obviously. But then, interestingly enough, the Jesuits never as a order. Uh, you know, I think the Benedictines, you can see the, the monastic orders, there was a certain, uh, uh, you could kind of keep, keep everybody committed better if you kept them, if you keep them in one place, <laughs> one home community. Um, the Jesuits never approached that. Their, their members are sent out on specific missions. It might be assignment to Georgetown University as a teacher. It might be to Latin America uh, for some social ministry. Um, it might be anything. They, you know, they're in, but they just individually go off and and do their thing um, as Jesuits uh, with that fourth vow of, uh, you know, um, uh, allegiance specifically to, uh, let's see, how was that phrase? Obedience to the sovereign pontiff, which of course all the orders are, um, you know, the Pope is the head of everybody. But I think this idea of Jesuits is almost a one-on-one -on -one, um, sort of thing, where as a Jesuit, you feel yourself personally committed directly to the Pope. Uh, you know, certainly there's a hierarchy of Je Jesuits, um, you know, higher and higher coadjutors, they're, they're called. But nevertheless, I think there's, whereas as a, 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 a Benedictine monk, uh, your allegiance would be within your monastic, the, you know, the, 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 um, the structure of your monastic community. Um, and as a Franciscan, you might feel a special allegiance to uh, the charism of, of St. Francis. Um, and, but the Jesuits are like, we're the Pope's men. We're, you know, we're the Pope's soldiers, so to speak, although they're not, they're not military. They're more, as I said, uh, diplomatic in, a, in a, an odd way, a diplomatic envoy, personal in, diplomatic envoys of the Pope. Um, 
let's see, this is the formation. Um, by the way, one of their, they have their own rules. They didn't adopt Benedict's rules like uh, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, uh, their founders, founder Ignatius Loyola and his two um, colleagues established their own their own uh, rule, uh, which was uh, approved by the Pope, um, and I'm sure has undergone modification. These rules, you know, have undergone modifications within the community, uh, and then they're represented to the Pope. But one thing that they're famous for, one aspect of their spirituality is uh, uh, represented by something called the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, which I don't know if you may have heard of that. Um, it is something that people, even now, you basically go on retreat, which means for a weekend you go to a monastery somewhere, the equivalent of a monastery, and the spiritual exercises or are, are a series of sort of mental images that you uh like a meditation uh that you meditate upon to enhance to deepen your um your true appreciation of you know the spiritual context which is i know that was all very ambiguously stated but one of the examples I usually give for folks who aren't familiar with this is in the third chapter of James Joyce's Portrait of an Artist of a Young Man. He gives a very he gives a prolonged uh, uh, account of as he's a young person in high in high school. He went apparently to a Jesuit uh, high school in Dublin. Um, this would have been a normal thing. The boys would have each year gone on a retreat and gone through the spiritual exercises. And so, for example, the first chapters of the spiritual, or, you know, the first meditations of the spiritual exercises have to do with imagining hell. <laughs> you know, and you're literally, you know, it, it guides you towards imagining what might be the pains of being condemned to hell for eternity. Um, and, you know, what sins of yours would be, would be of such as to endanger you to that, that imagination. So you go through one morning of imagining hell, flames, demons, I don't know. Um, and then you're supposed to think of, oh my gosh, I have all these personal sins which actually, you know, are, are op opening myself up to uh, the devil and to possibly ending up in hell. So uh, James Goyce, this is a, just one little excerpt out of what's a very long account, but what, that's what he's talking about. I think it's not, he doesn't expressly state what's going on, but he is going through the spirit, you know, a retreat of the spiritual exercises. And you can see the kind of level of, of um, extreme reaction that would have been uh, designedly um, uh, imbued in these, these young high schoolers in, in the retreat. Uh, and, and so that, that is, I mean, the Jesuits have a very tough side to them as well. Um, they they are, as Louisa said, they tend to be uh, oriented towards very progressive social causes. But at some spiritual levels, it's like to them, it's just like being a soldier. You have to go through exercises that will strengthen your faith. And this is one of their major tools. Now, I don't know if it's, you know, as we speak, in you know, sort of post year 2000 um, contemporary uh, Jesuit circles, this is this is done quite the same way. But I know you know up until just like you know pre 2000, I don't know why I'm picking 2000 just because it's a new new millennium. Um, people really adults too regularly went off uh, on retreats and used the spiritual exercise as the basic uh, guide for how the retreat progressed, the structure of the retreat. So if you've ever heard of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, it's a Jesuit thing and 
here's an idea, you know, this is just a brief glimpse of, of what that is. Um, today, the Jesuits uh, are huge. This is a slide I clipped from somewhere. I should have, I should have, uh, I failed to put the, um, the link to it, but uh, they're all over the world. Um, you know, they're huge. Uh, they supposedly are um, the largest single religious order with almost 20,000 members. Uh, that that num that statistic, like all statistics, has layering to it. Um, for example, there may be many more Benedictines in total, but due to all their branches, and similarly for the Franciscans, they don't total up the same way. But to date, the Jesuits don't have any branches. There's just the Jesuits, um, you know. And uh, so, again, they're 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 very much still in the game. And here are some famous, or at least note, Jesuits of note. Gerard Manley Hopkins was a, the famous poet was a Jesuit. Uh, the, the sort of very hip philosopher, theologian philosopher of the 1960s, Pierre de, Teilhard de Chardin um, uh, was a Jesuit. Uh, however, he was actually, because his his thought about the new sphere, et cetera, started to sort of uh, go outside of uh, accepted church dogma. He did, he was under a warning. He was never actually excommunicated like William of Ockham, uh, but he was, he was under a warning from a papal warning, whatever that is comprised of, which I guess probably restricted him from teaching or things of that nature. Um, although there has been talk recently that uh, the president pope might might officially ex posthumously uh, like they've done for Galileo uh, list that kind of um, that kind of uh, ruling against uh, the individual. And here's my slide, Louisa. <laughs> there, yep, there it is. I've slide. been to the. Uh, by the way, just want to comment. Quick comment. I've been to the audience in Rome with oh. Pope Francis. Wow. Um, I got to tell you about it. It's high, my mother and I went highly intimate, me, mom, and 30,000 other people. <laughs> it's held outdoors in the plaza because there's so many people. And when he comes out, it is bigger than any rock star I've ever seen. People go absolutely wild. I mean, they go absolutely wild when he comes out in his little Pope mobile and he makes the round. Wow. Yeah. Well, he's, he certainly, it's, it's a, you know, from the perspective of what we've just, I've spent so much time talking to you all about, um, it's a little confusing because his name is Francis. Yes, yes. So you tend to think, ah, St. Francis, Francis. Franciscan, but, right. But he's actually, he's actually a Jesuit. Um, and of course, he's a Spanish, uh, you know, he's a Latin American uh, a prelate, which was, uh, which was new, just as when John Paul II uh, was, you know, the first, uh, uh, the first pope from Poland, I believe. Um, and so, in any event, he is—he is like the rock star Jesuit at the moment. He is, <laughs> and I'm sure will be for a while. And yes. uh, with that, I uh, come to a close. Oh my gosh, Anne! I can't thank you enough. What a beautiful and incredible, great, great, oh, wonderful, great. Um, thank you. incredible, thank you. just thank super. You. Learned so much. Right. Well, I hope. Yeah. Thank you. You take, a, you take a helm of one of the uh, most leaders. So. <laughs> oh <laughs> well, my uh, gosh! You incredible. Know, Paul, you, John, Greg, you know Richard, you know, and uh, um, this was so <laughs> terrific. Yeah. And thank you very much. I learned a lot. Let me ask you, how long did it take? Awesome job, prepare? Dan. Dan, thank you so much. Well, you know, let me say, in all all sincerity, it was a, it was. I am, I, I am humbled and. <laughs> that you all stuck with me for three hours and <laughs> I can only hope that it's hanging on for was. the Jesuits and the Jesuits <laughs> yeah. I love them <laughs> no, I'm good. No, no, that's a good order. presentation you know you know how to always keep that tease out there and keep them hanging in but I <laughs> really I, I'm I'm honored that you all uh and I and I very much hope that there was it was worth your while oh my God. Uh, just that's a funny. personal note um I, I hung on to listen to, uh, about the Jesuits because probably the goodest man I know 
is a former teaching colleague of mine, and he studied to be a Jesuit priest for seven years and uh, obviously decided it was um, not a commitment he could make, but he has lived the ultimate Jesuit life. Um, I am not Christian. Uh, however, I would run to him in an instant if uh, I needed help. Um, he uh, I, just an incredible person and um, a joy to know. So thanks That's again. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 as I said at the beginning, I, uh, observing uh, all those communities uh, mm -hmm. that were around me when I was living near Catholic University, uh, it was, you know, they were wonderful people. Again, they're human commu communities, they have human histories, and I think the church has learned to be very open about, um, about its failings. Uh, but uh, in general, the people you meet are are quite inspirational in this world of ours today. Mm. Yeah, I want to tell you the story. Do you guys know the story of Pope Francis's name and why he chose it? No. It is unique and special. No other pope has ever been. I think he's Francis the first. No other pope has chosen that name. Mm. When he was chosen to be pope, which he was surprised by. <laughs> A colleague whispered in his ear, Jorge, his name's Jorge, don't forget the poor. And he, because he has always spent his life with the poor, taking care of the poor. And he's, don't forget the poor, because he knew he was going to be elevated into the, basically like a kingship, right? So uh, he immediately said in his mind came the thought of St. Francis. And he, uh, he chose that name. So it goes along with your wonderful history that you gave us of how St. Francis had revolutionized the church and wanted to be with the poor and was... You know, not into that. So, Anne, it really just dovetails right, right through that, right? Even well, though he's a Jesuit, he well, has right. such a, a, a wonderful admiration. Yeah, Saint Francis. Yeah, he. Uh, we've we've been very fortunate. Many of our modern popes, that's for sure. Um, yeah, and and uh, Pope Francis. And unfortunate. Been, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, we've had we've had some some remarkable remarkable mm -hmm. figures, uh, like Zach mm -hmm. pointed out, at John Paul II. Mm -hmm. um and so uh so mm -hmm. the the beat goes on, goes on. <laughs> well thank you zach um oh thank you i mean you know, um, thank you. This, was great. this was this was incredible and uh let me just run through the schedule with you guys um i'm gonna post the, the schedule right now i mean there's only you know 13 left i apologize i should have done it in the beginning I, and i didn't uh Zach, the, the schedule is not in the Carta Magna or the Magnus Carta or the... Omnicarta, yeah. Okay, yeah. so as long as you know. But, uh, you know, this uh, Wednesday we have History of World Cup and Thursday we have Richard the Lionheart, Third Crusade, that follows right right through this. This, wow. is, a, this is a good timing. Yeah. And, uh, Andrew, yeah. Nice Andrew, who is our scholar, uh, you know, he he last time did the you know John the Leckland it was amazing, and so he's gonna he's gonna do one for uh, Richard the Lionheart, and he goes in detail. So that this is gonna be a good compliment, even though nothing mm -hmm. you know not, nothing could top this. Oh, <laughs> don't be silly, of course, of course it could. Um, yeah, but, and uh, uh, Sunday, uh, Saturday we have Diodoci, uh, the generals Alexander the Great. So we keep jumping from Greek to. <laughs> But we did, did we did mention the Orthodox Church today, so yeah, yeah there you this, go. This is pre-Orthodox Church, so pre. And next week we have a lot of good ones: a history of wine. Uh, we have uh, conquest of Americas. Sergio is gonna, you know, the uh, ancient that's weaponry. That's a metal that'll, that'll yeah. blend in too. Ooh, yeah, nice. that was you know. So and uh, yeah, we have a lot of really good ones uh, this month, and uh, you know. Uh, Whatever you guys, whatever taste anybody you know has, you know we history of metallurgy. We have um, you know how the Greeks identified as Greeks. You know the the persona of Hellenistic persona is interesting. So there's a lot of philosophical. Um, Zach, may I ask a question? Yeah. You posted a wonderful one called <clears throat> Jewish Nature, but I'm <clears throat> confused as to the what does that mean exactly? Okay. What's it about? So me, there was it would be rich, rich going to present uh -huh. that. 
Yeah. And, and this is what he said. And um, so, uh, and then he was mm -hmm. also afraid that, you know, it would be, you know, misconstrued as uh, anti-Semitic. But here it says, I'd like to give a presentation on the allegorical Jewish nature of the J.R. Tolkien dwarfs and <laughs> J.K. Rowling's goblins and discussing <laughs> how they incorporate Jewish and assimilation themes and may have certain anti-Semitic overtones and where they diverge from the Jewish IRL experience. So it's uh, it's going to be an interesting one. I mean, yeah. So and Rich always you know does good presentations. So we should you know we should be able. Uh, Thank you, because it wasn't clear what it was specific. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's such a long description. I don't know. <laughs> it sounds there. Yeah. You know, when you go through Meetup, like we don't get your descriptions, but I'll look on your the site. Um, go ahead. Yeah. By the way, I had one little um, last tidbit for you all to take one last takeaway. Abelard and Heloise, Benedictines. <laughs> oh, they were both? Oh, yes, yes huh? they were both. Well, when they had their love affair, the romance, I should characterize yeah. it, neither of them were members of religious orders. Um, uh, however, in the aftermath of the tragic, uh, tragic parting, um, they, uh, they uh, both entered... Um, uh, uh, Abelard entered a, a um, Benedictine monastery and Heloise mm -hmm. lived the rest of her life, even though they were technically married, um, mm -hmm. I believe, uh, in a Benedictine a convent to which she became the abbess um, mm -hmm. and had quite an illustrious career as an abbess. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that there's a romantic aspect to the religious orders. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a grim one, but there it is. Okay, well, thank you all very much. I'm going to leave, and thank you, Zach, and thank, thank you, you, everyone. Oh, really wonderful. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Very a great good. Week. Thanks, Anne. Right.